In 2010, a user going by the name Betty Weston would upload her poem, Working Happy, to allpoetry.com. Maybe it's the rye, or the time of night, but my day was not so bad, filled with work and satisfaction, and old people. See, I work with old people, and I love their candidacy, their points, their wrinkles, their frailties, their refusing to eat anything but ice cream, even their smell. I love the finality, the resignation, the knowing this is their last home. Yes, sometimes I feel angry, but mostly at the staff, the people expected to meet the aging needs. I want to see everyone happy, everyone content, and when others who are paid to do so don't, well, I boil over. Come on, these people are paying to be here, to end their days in a beige, diapered wasteland. Tonight, though, there is not even a simmer. Everyone is in bed. Everyone is content. Every tooth soaking. Every diaper done up. Every pad in place. So I am content. My happiness slides into place. Like the catheter, oh my god, like, a, like the catheter I put in tonight, and my soul vents itself. Like the healthy urine collecting in the bag. Jesus Christ, this is weird. Anyways, shortly after, she uploaded another poem, titled, I Never. I never gave in to it. The urge to experience. The urge to entwine arms, legs, skin, souls. I watched you and yearned, but wouldn't admit what I wanted, needed, dreamed of. You smiled, I smiled. Sweet conversation and pounded heart and sweaty palms all happened, but that was all I allowed myself. Terrified to even steal a single kiss, and now I wonder why. Why did I keep myself apart? Why did I give in to so-called morality? Why did I let rules rule me? Here on this bald, scalped, emaciated, tortured bed, I wish. I could have had a sweet burning memory to fill me, while life empties. But I chose chastity, and she is a poor companion. Now that most of what I feel is pain, and fading, and almost finality. As my life is measured by intravenous drops, I yearn for the ghost of a touch that was never conceived. My life had no birth of passion, but now it has a death to all and everything, and even to how I wish I had given in. Within both poems were clues about Betty, where she worked, and how she viewed herself. But most shockingly, she had also left clues about her murders and how she, at the time of writing, had attempted to kill nearly 14 people. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Elizabeth Wetlaufer and how this nurse relieved her stress by killing her patients. This case came recommended by multiple of our subscribers, and if there is a case you would like to bring attention to or see covered, let me know by emailing me at dreading.official at gmail.com. My brother and I are currently working through all of your suggestions and responding to emails daily. So again, if there's a case you want to see covered, let us know. If you want to support this channel, consider supporting us for as little as $1 a month on Patreon. YouTube has been demonetizing our channel, taking down videos, as well as making it increasingly taxing for us to upload. I have always been clear that I will continue to produce content regardless, but if there is ever a time when YouTube takes our videos down, they will always be on Patreon. With all of that said, let us begin. Elizabeth was born Beth Parker in the small farming community of South Zora Township on the outskirts of Woodstock, Ontario. She was raised in a strict, fundamentalist household as her father, Doug Parker, was an elder in the local church, and he was a stringent man. Beth's home life was incredibly controlled, with her parents often dictating how Beth should behave. For example, she was told only to speak when spoken to and make herself small in front of others. Her parents repeatedly informed Beth that good girls are seen but not heard, and as such, she had a hard time fitting in with those her age. When Beth was in school, she was picked on. Everything from her name to the way she looked was ridiculed, and in response, Beth would attempt to rewrite the narrative. When kids in her class made fun of her and snidedly called her Bethy, Beth opted to state that she had opted to change her name to Beth with an E, which was French. She wore the title change as a badge of honor and something cool that she had done, in the hopes that the kids in her class would stop making fun of her. When she was in high school and a boy had made fun of her for her weight and her haircut, she attempted to frame him by pulling the fire alarm and saying he had been the one to do it. And when she tried to kiss another girl in her class and was rejected, she stated that it was the girl who wanted to kiss her. From an early age, Elizabeth knew that she liked women. However, her parents instilled in her that homosexuality was a sin and that good girls do not kiss other girls. She grew up seeing multiple men and women thrown out of their congregation for being gay, and she dealt with an immense amount of shame because of that. After high school, 
She enrolled at London Baptist Bible College with the hopes of getting a degree in counseling. She told others that her ultimate passion was taking care of others and that she knew better than anyone how cruel the world can be. She talked about her bullying, how she had been ridiculed throughout her life, and how the intense pressures of her parents, most notably her father had put on her, gave her a profound amount of empathy for others. She wanted to use that empathy to help other people. Elizabeth saw going to college as her first real venture out into the world. She hadn't been allowed to be a teenager, to hang out with others and make mistakes the way her peers had. She was excited to be going away to college and being on her own for the first time. But her father had other plans. After Elizabeth decided to go to London Baptist, her father surprised her by attending college as well, going so far as to take classes she was in. Her father allegedly stated that he had been wanting to go back to school for a while, and he wanted to make sure that Elizabeth was all right in her classes. He also stated that he wanted to ensure that the courses she was taking were appropriate for her, as he didn't want her wrapped up in some new wave thinking. This development did little to stifle Elizabeth, though. For the first time, she was able to make friends and be on her own. She loved her classes and her schedule and had gone to multiple different churches in the area, trying to figure out what she liked. In her first semester, she met and began dating another woman and was in her first relationship. However, shortly after getting together, another student would out Elizabeth to the school and her family. She was forced to leave the school for some time, and her family, now confronted with her sexuality, would force her to go through conversion therapy with the hopes that it would make her straight. Elizabeth wouldn't talk about her time in conversion therapy with others, saying that it was too traumatizing to discuss. However, she would go back to London Baptist, eventually earning a bachelor's degree in counseling. But by this time, Elizabeth felt adrift. She had hoped to be in a different, better place by the time she had graduated. When she envisioned becoming a counselor, she had hoped to help others going through trauma, unpacking their burdens, and giving them the tools to get through it. But after going back into the closet and continuing to pretend to be straight for her family, she no longer felt like she would be able to help people that way. How could she give others the tools to fix their life if she couldn't do it for herself? Instead, she went back to school this time to become a nurse, and by 1995, she obtained her degree. She bounced around from hospital to hospital for a while, taking issue with the different medical facilities she found employment at. Some, she claimed, were too isolated and made her depressed. At some hospitals, she found their doctors and nurses were too clicky and uninterested in getting to know her. How true this was remains to be seen, as Elizabeth was hiding a host of her own issues. In 1997, she would marry Donnie Wetlaufer a local truck driver who she met at church. Beth didn't love Donnie, nor was she attracted to him. However, she knew that her parents wouldn't be happy if she remained unwed. In their mind, her being single was just as bad as her being gay, and that meant the conversion therapy hadn't actually worked. Following the wedding, Beth was beset with a multitude of issues. She was forced to seek treatment of borderline personality disorder after lashing out at her immediate family. Shortly thereafter, her drug addiction was revealed, as she had begun stealing drugs from her work and taking them throughout the day, even while on the job. She had overdosed on hydromorphone, and after being caught stealing, her nursing license was restricted. Temporarily unable to work at any hospitals in her area, she instead began working as a personal support worker in various care homes. At the same time, Beth began to experiment with her sexuality using the internet. She wasn't happy with Donnie, far from it, and she began to reach out to women online, seeking a romantic connection. Most of the responses she got were short-lived flings. She would send emails professing her love and desire for women she had met on message boards, telling them how she longed for a day they could be together. But oftentimes, these relationships fizzled out before anything more could come of it. That is, until 2007, 10 years after marrying Donnie. Elizabeth had begun corresponding with a woman online. She wrote her multiple emails declaring her love and fidelity, only for Donnie to find the emails. Donnie immediately left Elizabeth, refusing to listen to any excuses about the cheating. But with him out of the picture, Elizabeth finally felt free. Her parents had heavily admonished divorce, almost as much as they admonished homosexuality. And with the knowledge that she was already going to disappoint them in one respect, she no longer cared about the other. After Donnie left, Elizabeth moved in with a woman she had been speaking with online, and the pair quickly got engaged. But things were far from perfect in Elizabeth's life, as she had already taken on a second job, and with it, developed a dangerous new addiction.
Wetlaufer had spent 12 years of nursing experience at the time she began working at Caressant Care in 2007. She was overqualified for the position she applied for, and no one working alongside her understood why she wouldn't just work for a hospital. But those working alongside her at Caressant Care described her as a kind, generous woman who loved what she did. And in a job as thankless as nursing, that mattered. Caressant Care dealt with elderly clients, many of which would be confused and uncomfortable being in a home. Oftentimes, they were dealing with dementia, Alzheimer's, and other degenerative diseases that resulted in them being less than compliant when dealing with their caretakers. Working with this specific clientele requires a person to be patient, strong, and above all else, kind. And many people originally believed that to be true of Elizabeth. But that was far from the case as Elizabeth would quickly begin killing some of her patients. The first person Elizabeth would attempt to kill was a woman by the name Clotilde Adriano. Adriano was born October 25, 1920, and resided in the Woodstock area for her entire life. She moved into Caressant Care March 5, 2007, alongside her sister-in-law, Albina de Medeiros. But just three months after moving into the care facility, Mrs. Adriano would be the first of Elizabeth's victims. Mrs. Adriano dealt with diabetes and required insulin to treat the affliction. And in June of 2007, Elizabeth would be placed in charge of giving Mrs. Adriano her medication. According to Elizabeth's recollection, she felt no anger or malice towards Adriano, but felt immense anger about her life in general. She wasn't earning enough to keep her life afloat, and she was dealing with her addiction to opioids and alcohol as well as her parents' refusal to acknowledge her girlfriend, instead choosing to say she had a roommate who was mentally ill. Mere days after being hired by Caris and Care, Elizabeth went into Adriano's room and injected her with an additional dose of insulin. The facility didn't monitor or secure its insulin supplies as they did with their other more addictive medications, so the additional dose went unnoticed. This additional dose was meant to send Adriano and later other victims into hypoglycemic shock, which can result in seizures, convulsions, coma, and death. The additional units that Elizabeth gave to Mrs. Adriano was meant to kill her, with her telling the police later on that she felt as if God was calling her to kill the woman. She clarified later that she knew that what she was doing was wrong, and that God wasn't actually acting through her, but she felt as if it was Adriano's time to die. Thankfully, other nurses working that night were able to notice that she was suffering from hypoglycemic shock and save her. Unfortunately, this wouldn't be the only time Elizabeth made an attempt on her life. Elizabeth's next victim was Mrs. Adriano's own sister-in-law, Albina de Medeiros. Between some time before December 31st, 2007, Elizabeth gave Mrs. de Medeiros an additional dose of insulin, similar to how she had done with Adriano, and it seemed that she enjoyed dosing Albina in particular. She would recall that she injected Albina multiple times over, each time adding more and more insulin, but each time she was unsuccessful. She also would dose Adriano a second time, but when exactly this happened is unknown. It wouldn't be until August of 2007 that Elizabeth made her first kill, and this time she felt the person deserved it. James Silcox was born February 17, 1923. He was a World War II veteran and had been married for 63 years to his wife, Agnes. James was an extremely hardworking and proud man, and when he began to decline in his later years, he fought tooth and nail to remain independent. His daughter would recall buying her parents matching walkers, to which her father flatly refused the gift, declaring he didn't need assistance walking. James was a loving father, devoted husband, and a wonderful all-around person. But when he was admitted to caressant care, it was clear he was declining. He was often confused, unaware of where he was and why he was there. Oftentimes, he would call out for his wife, Agnes, refusing nurses' care because he didn't know them. According to the medical notes, some of which were written by Elizabeth, he also exhibited inappropriate behavior at times and made inappropriate comments at the nurses. In these moments, he often thought his caretakers were his wife. On August 11, 2007, James couldn't recognize himself, where he was, or photographs of his family that were in the room. When Elizabeth arrived at work, Mr. Silcox was confused and scared, and it was her duty to take care of him. However, she found his behavior angering. She thought the comments he made were vulgar, and that he was taking advantage of his position in the care home. She was particularly upset by the fact that he continued to call her Agnes and not remember her name. With that in mind, she went to the medical storage room and grabbed 50 units of insulin, planning to inject James at the site of a surgical incision to avoid detection. Elizabeth would later claim she wanted to make sure he died. 
as Clotilde and Adriana hadn't, and felt he deserved it more than they had. She stayed in his room to ensure he was killed, and as he died, she reported that he repeated the words, I'm sorry and I love you, a dying declaration to his wife. Later on, she would say she felt awful and ashamed, but also reported that after killing the World War II veteran, she felt like pressure had been relieved and a weight had been lifted from her emotions. Elizabeth left the room without notice, and it would be hours until he was found by another nurse. After his death, Elizabeth was the one to inform his family, and disgustingly, when they arrived to see James for the last time, the family made sure to thank her for all she had done for him. They felt as if she had been a great nurse, not knowing he would still be alive had she not taken his life into her hands. But eventually, the pressure that killing had relieved from Elizabeth slowly made its way back. She was still struggling with dependency issues, attempting to take care of her and her girlfriend, and trying to stay in touch with her parents, despite the obvious change in lifestyle. And as her stress grew, so did her want to kill. Maurice Granite was born February 7, 1923, and spent the majority of his life in Tilsonburg. When he was eventually admitted to Caress and Care Nursing Home, he was battling cancer and dealing with numerous ailments. By December of 2007, his health began to wane, with him losing a large amount of weight and no longer eating. Though he wasn't diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, he tended to be confused, often not understanding where he was and why he was there. Because of his confusion, he often acted inappropriately, and on one occasion, he had grabbed Elizabeth's breast. He had done the same with other nurses, but they would all go on to state that they knew he meant little by it, as he couldn't even remember where he was during those moments. However, this infuriated Elizabeth. She felt as if, like James, he was taking advantage of his position. This, alongside the mounting stress in other areas of her life, led her to deciding to murder Maurice Granite. On December 23, 2007, she injected between 40 to 60 units of short-acting insulin into Mr. Granite, with the hopes to watch him die as she had with James. However, her plans were ruined as she had to clock out hours before he would die. Still, she noted down his waning vital signs and made it a point to call his family to inform them that he was likely going to die in the coming hours. Shortly after murdering Maurice, Elizabeth would face another hitch. The woman she had been in a committed relationship with, going so far as to tell people she was engaged to, had ended. Elizabeth was said to be heartbroken, talking about the upset with anyone who would listen. However, she would eventually meet and begin a relationship with Sheila Andrews, a prison cafeteria worker in Prince Albert. They had met online, and like before, Elizabeth had wooed Sheila with praise and adulation. She would declare that she had never known a love like Sheila's before, and every other relationship had been false, comparatively. Sheila would say that this kind of praise was unusual, but felt as if Elizabeth was just being hyperbolic. It wouldn't be until they met she realized how bizarre Elizabeth was. Andrews invited Elizabeth out for a week-long trip. That way, they could properly begin their relationship. But from the moment Elizabeth landed, she put on a show. She showered Sheila in hugs and kisses, and talked non-stop how in love she was with her. Sheila felt overwhelmed, and tried to match her girlfriend's enthusiasm, but she knew that the relationship wasn't going to work out. The following is Sheila's statements, as given to News 2. She pouted a lot and had little temper tantrums. You know, like if she didn't get something her own way, like my affection and stuff like that. There was a lot of childish issues with her, and I just thought... You're a grown woman, act like it. After the trip, Sheila told Elizabeth the relationship was not going to work out, and once more, Elizabeth dealt with her anger through killing the men and women in her care. The next victim was Wayne Hedges. Wayne was born April 23, 1951, and he was admitted to Crescent Care due to his struggle with diabetes, schizophrenia, and other mental disabilities. Elizabeth would go on to describe Wayne as being uncooperative and annoying as his mental illness made it hard for him to distinguish reality. He was often scared, but other nurses maintained that throughout his care, he tried his best. Following her breakup, Elizabeth intentionally overdosed Wayne and claimed she only did so because it was his time to go. She also stated that unlike her other victims, Wayne had wanted to die. However, as Wayne lay dying, Elizabeth administered medication to restore his glucose levels. She claims to have no memory of doing this and in her own admission, simply claimed that he didn't die. But it was possible that another nurse saw what was happening and instructed Elizabeth to help Wayne. However, we cannot be sure. Shortly thereafter, Elizabeth attempted to kill another resident, 
Michael Prindle. Michael Stephen Prindle was born June 1, 1949, and was admitted to Crescent Care on October 20, 2006, after his diagnosis of Huntington's disease resulted in him needing 24-hour care. Unlike the other men Elizabeth attempted to kill, she didn't think Michael was annoying or evil. Instead, she simply felt bad for him. She claimed that his disease had stolen his life from him, and that it physically pained her to have to take care of him, knowing that he was suffering. In 2009, she attempted to kill Michael, using the method that she had practically perfected up to this point. She gave Michael upwards of 90 units of insulin, and as she gave it to him, she claimed that she felt her body surging, an action she claimed felt similar to an orgasm. But Michael didn't die, despite God willing it. According to Elizabeth, Mr. Prindle went into hypoglycemic shock, but after hours without medicine or treatment, was fine. On October 13th, 2011, Elizabeth would take another life, this time deciding to murder Gladys Jean Millard. Gladys was born October 11th, 1924, in Nova Scotia. She was an incredibly active woman, participating in her church, multiple local charities, and service clubs. However, in 2006, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and required round-the-clock care that her children weren't able to provide. Elizabeth's opinion on Gladys changed over time. At first, she loved Gladys, finding her spunky and spirited. She didn't let her disease slow her down and was always compliant with the nurses. However, as Gladys continued to lose her memory, she began to get agitated with her caretakers, often refusing to comply with their directions due to confusion. Elizabeth began to get annoyed working with Gladys, and she began to think that Gladys was intentionally making things harder than they needed to be. Instead of just listening, everything had to be a battle, and Elizabeth felt as if life would be a lot easier if she just died. On October 13th, she went into Mrs. Millard's room to inject her with a large amount of insulin, but Millard fought back. She didn't want to take the medicine, and she didn't trust the nurse. But as Gladys fought back, Elizabeth became more determined to murder her. She injected her with the insulin, then went back to work as if nothing had happened. She noted in Gladys's patient notes that she had been awake all night, crying out, and that she had just gotten to sleep at 7 a.m. She instructed the staff to leave her alone for a while so that she could rest. When Gladys was checked on at 9.45 a.m., she was diuretic, cold, and foaming at the mouth. Her body was twitching, and mere hours later, she would die. Her death was slow and painful, and like every single one of Elizabeth's victims, entirely undeserved. That same month, Elizabeth killed Helen Matheson. Helen Muriel Matheson was born June 4, 1916. She was a kind, spunky woman who was active in her church and enjoyed the sweeter things in life. She was admitted to Crescent Care Nursing Home when she was 93 and dealing with dementia. However, the majority of the time, she was incredibly lucid. On October 25, 2011, Helen was up and talkative with the staff and had discussed how she used to love baking back when she could do it herself. Another nurse on staff talked to her at length about the pies she would make, and while on her break, went out to get Helen the exact pie she claimed was her favorite. The pair then ate the pie together, with the other nurse noting, she ate four bites with ice cream, then smiled and said, that's enough dear, but the crust was lovely. Elizabeth felt, for some reason, that this was a sign that she should die. She would tell police later that Helen was just waiting to die, and that God was acting through her trying to help her along. And so, even then, she gave Helen upwards of 60 units of insulin, all the while laughing. The next day, Helen's health was in rapid decline. When Elizabeth returned to work the next day, Helen had stopped eating or drinking. Two nights later, at 1 a.m., Helen had stopped breathing entirely. Her death, like the others, had been long and arduous, with her in a hellish amount of pain throughout. The month following, Elizabeth killed Mary Zerowinski. Mary was born April 7, 1915, and had always been an incredibly independent woman. She enjoyed getting her hair done and taking care of herself, but when she was admitted to Crescent Care, she had been diagnosed with dementia. November 6th was Elizabeth's last shift before leaving for the holidays. She had planned to take a Caribbean cruise over the holidays with her girlfriend. However, the pair had broken up before the cruise was set to depart. Still, they planned on taking it together, as neither wanted to miss the trip. According to colleagues, Elizabeth was anxious about the trip. She wanted to get back together with her ex and thought that the trip would push them back together. She talked about it incessantly at work, and that day, she was feeling incredibly anxious, and in her words, Mary provided a much-needed sense of relief. 
Elizabeth would claim that Mary believed that her health was declining, and the first thing she said to her when she saw Elizabeth was that she wanted to go to her deathbed. With that in mind, she moved Mary into the palliative care room. At 4.30, Elizabeth injected Mary with upwards of 80 units of insulin. She recalled injecting Mary and how it eased all of her anxiety that she had. She said she got, quote, that feeling inside and began to laugh as she killed Mary. The next day, she would be pronounced dead at 2.15 a.m. After her vacation to the Caribbean, friends of Elizabeth would describe her as quiet and standoffish. She was usually incredibly loud and charismatic, but she seemed depressed. When asked, she would tell friends that she was dealing with a loss, as before the trip, one of her favorite patients had died. When asked how, she would say she didn't know, but the whole thing bothered her. At this point in the timeline, Elizabeth had killed five people, but attempted to kill four more, bringing her grand total to nine. But as far as her colleagues were concerned, everything was fine. Given that they worked at a nursing home, patients dying was incredibly common. And to make things even easier for Elizabeth, she was the resident in charge of checking to see if anything untoward may have caused the residents to die unexpectedly. In layman terms, after she murdered people, she was the only one meant to determine if a murder had occurred, which she never did. But while no one around her noticed her addiction to murdering their own residents, they did notice her drug addiction. To this day, Elizabeth claims that she never went to work high or did drugs at work. However, multiple people claimed that they often found her during work hours passed out in the basement. She claimed that when she was high, she felt like the best version of herself. And as such, when she took more of the pills, she felt as if she no longer needed to kill. For two years, she stopped purposely injecting her patients with insulin. But July 13th, 2013, that changed. Helen Whitelaw Marshall Young was born June 29th, 1923 in Scotland. She served in World War II before moving to Canada in 1948 and settling in the Woodstock area. She was an incredibly outspoken and adventurous woman, and those who knew her claimed she had no fear. In her old age, she began struggling with dementia and made the decision to move into caressant care. However, she was far from comfortable in the home. She had spent so much of her life traveling and taking care of herself that moving into a home was a huge struggle. She rejected help from any nurse and would loudly complain about everything, from her room to the smell of the home to how the nurses looked. She would repeatedly state that she wanted to die rather than continue living in the home. And on July 13th, Elizabeth decided she would make that happen. Elizabeth injected Helen with 60 units of insulin and over the next hours watched Mrs. Young slowly and painfully perish. When Helen's niece came to the home to retrieve her aunt's belongings, Elizabeth made it a point to talk to her. She hugged the young woman and told her she was sorry for her loss and what a great woman Helen was. She had no idea she was hugging her aunt's killer. According to her own statements, Elizabeth claimed that after her surges, she would feel immense guilt for what she had done. Seeing the families, watching as they picked up their relatives' things, it all made her feel as if she had done something wrong, which objectively she had. Eventually, she felt the need to confess. She had begun attending a multi-denominational church in the area, and after killing Mrs. Young, she decided she would confess her sins. She went to her pastor's home and told him and his wife that she'd killed multiple people at her job. Elizabeth told the police, They prayed over me, and they said to me, How this was God's grace. But if you ever do this again, we will have to turn you into the police. However, when questioned by the police afterwards, the pastor stated he didn't believe Elizabeth, as in their short time of knowing her, she had been known to lie. He believed that her admission was either her outright lying for attention, or, most likely, guilt from people dying at work. Either way, he didn't want to tell the police on the off chance she was lying. Elizabeth would refrain from killing until March of 2014, nearly a year later. Maureen Pickering was born June 9, 1935. She had been admitted to crescent care by a local hospital following her diagnosis with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. According to staff notes, as Mrs. Pickering's mind began to deteriorate, she became aggressive with the staff. She didn't know what was happening and felt as if the staff was often being mean to her and that they were the ones that caused her to be in pain. As such, she would refuse to do what they said, and because of that, Elizabeth felt the need to kill her, or at least incapacitate her enough that she was easier to deal with. When talking to police, she stated that though she had originally felt the urge to kill Maureen, she didn't want to kill her because the pastor had told her not to. So instead, she told herself, quote, No, I don't want her to die, but if I could somehow give her enough of a dose to give her a coma, 
coma, something to change her brain waves, maybe make her less mobile and less hard to handle. I really wanted to make sure that she, her mind would change a bit before she came back, which is horrific. Elizabeth gave Maureen two injections, amounting to 140 units, and even though that was more than she had used on the majority of her victims, she claimed that she just wanted to make sure that Maureen would come back with a better attitude. The next day, she would be found unresponsive and was transferred to Woodstock General Hospital, where she suffered a stroke. For the next four days, she would lay unresponsive until she died on March 28, 2014. Following Maureen's death, Elizabeth was fired. Though the extent of her actions were unknown to her co-workers, she had made multiple medication errors that caused harm to her patients, and other staff believed that she was stealing from the facility. Carissant reported her numerous mistakes to the Ontario College of Nurses, the professional organization that oversees nursing practices and conduct, but the college took no known action to sanction Elizabeth. Because of that, her drug use, stealing, and details of how she abused her post remained private, with Carescent Care being unable to warn any future employer of her actions. Weeks after being fired by Carescent, Elizabeth was interviewed for a job at Meadow Park Long-Term Care in Linden, Ontario. The facility needed a nurse to help care for its approximately 120 patients. When asked about her previous termination, Elizabeth told Meadow Park's nursing supervisor that she had been fired for making medicine errors. The supervisor told Elizabeth she believed in second chances and offered her a one-year contract working evenings. Immediately after being hired by Meadow Park, Elizabeth killed again. Arpad Horvath was born November 14, 1938, and was a proud Hungarian. He was admitted to Meadow Park due to ongoing struggles with dementia. Like the majority of people Elizabeth killed, Arpad was often confused due to his dementia and acted out because of it. He would make inappropriate, at times explicit suggestions to the staff, and had a hard time understanding where he was. He would get scared and believe that the nurses were trying to hurt him, and as such would lash out, kicking and hitting them in an attempt to protect himself. On August 21, 2014, Elizabeth attempted to assist Arpad, only for him to yell, spit, and attempt to strike her as she approached. That action, in her mind, signed his death warrant. At 8 p.m. that night, Elizabeth entered Arpad's room and injected him with 140 units of insulin, and he would die seven days later after going into a coma. Shortly after killing Arpad, Elizabeth would resign from Meadow Park, citing her addiction to drugs and alcohol. Her mother drove her to a rehab facility located in Port Colborne, Ontario, and she stayed there for about a month. In early 2015, about two months after getting out of rehab, Elizabeth was caring for the sick and elderly again, working part-time at care homes in towns surrounding Woodstock. She got a job at Telfar Place and nearly immediately went back to killing, or at the very least, attempting to. Sandra Taller was born April 6, 1939, and was living at Telfar Place due to her issues with dementia. According to Elizabeth, when she attended to Sandra, she simply felt that the woman no longer wanted to be alive, and decided that she would help her along the way. On September 6, 2015, she injected Sandra with 140 units of insulin, and would have died had it not been for the other nurses working at Telfar. When Elizabeth left work, Sandra had just about gone into hypoglycemic shock, which was immediately noticed by the nurses. They were able to treat Sandra, preventing a long and arduous death, one that would have resulted in days of suffering. Her last victim would be Beverly Bertram in 2016. Unlike any of her other patients, Beverly was not in a care home. Instead, Elizabeth had been hired by an agency who made house calls. Beverly was just 68 years old and recovering from surgery when Elizabeth arrived at her home. She was in good health and mentally competent, but Elizabeth still planned to kill her. On August 20th, Elizabeth broke into the home while Beverly was in the shower and attempted to steal her insulin so she could use it the next day when she used it in her planned overdose. However, Beverly caught her in the home. Elizabeth claimed that she had come back because she forgot medical equipment, but still, Beverly felt like something was wrong. The next day, Elizabeth came back for her appointment and gave Beverly 180 units of insulin at once. By the end of the appointment, Beverly stated that she felt nauseous and dizzy, but was otherwise all right. Elizabeth would state in the days that followed, she would pull up Beverly's records to see if she had succumbed to the insulin and was disappointed to see that she hadn't died. But shortly thereafter, her killing spree would come to an end. On August 29, 2016, Elizabeth resigned from her position at St. Elizabeth Healthcare after she was told that she would be working with diabetic children. 
while she believed that she would never kill a child, she realized that she could no longer control herself. When she got angry, she could justify murder. And having failed to kill Beverly Bertram, a woman who she would admit wasn't annoying or needed to die, she knew that she would be drawn to kill the children in her care. And for her, that was a bridge too far. About a month later, Elizabeth would admit herself into the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. Like she had when she had talked to her pastor, she confessed to killing multiple men and women, intentionally giving them enough insulin to kill them. And similar to how her pastor had responded, the professionals working at the center had no idea if she was being honest or not. They evaluated Elizabeth and found that she had suffered from borderline personality disorder and had a proclivity to lie about her own importance. They wanted to make sure that she wasn't attempting to get attention off of the heinous claims and asked her to be detailed about her recollections. For days, she recounted the murders to her counselors and was extremely forthcoming about what had happened. She gave names, discussed actions, and when she was questioned, about details, her story never wavered. Still unsure, they asked her to write down exactly what had happened, telling her it would make it easier for her to unburden herself by writing, and within two days she composed four pages, outlining everything she had done. With the center assured that she was telling the truth, they contacted the police and provided them with all the information Elizabeth had given them. On September 29th, 2016, she was temporarily released from her psychiatric hold to speak to the police. She once again confessed to the police, going into detail about what she had done and why she had done it. But after 40 minutes, she asked to be returned to the facility to rest. Another interview was scheduled for October 5th, 2016. The following is that interview. Unlike other interviews we've discussed on this channel, this interrogation is being done in order to confirm Elizabeth's story, not coax it out. Had she not come forward herself about the killings, she could and likely would have continued to work, killing innocent people and saying that those instances were just slight misunderstandings. She would have been able to continue getting employment in the area, and no one would be the wiser. The police are in a strange position where all they have to do is confirm the facts of her story, rather than search for them themselves, and their only goal is to keep her comfortable. There's too many people moving and shaking around here, and you can't really keep track of who's doing what. So, um, so yeah, like I said, um, I'm, I'm just going to go through for everything in this room is audio and video recorded first right. off. Are you okay, okay with that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to go through, like I said, a couple formalities, cover a few little things off, things that I have to do on my end that I, I, I right. need to do, and uh, things that I just want to tell you and make sure that we're all on the same page before we, uh, before we get going. Okay. Okay? So, first off, um, today is Wednesday, October the 5th, 2016, and on my phone right now, I'll just use that as a, a time reference, it's 514. Okay. So 1714, we'll just use that as a start time of our conversation here today. Um, again, my name is Nathan Hergock with the Woodstock Police Service. I currently work in our crime unit. Okay. And uh, we met a short time ago in downtown Toronto, correct? Yes. Right? Yes. So um, we came to a facility where you've spent the last uh, few weeks, from what I understand. Yes. And uh, we met with Dr. Khan and, yes. and his team of uh, associates, yes. and I believe you were under his care for the last little while, correct? Yeah, for the last three weeks. Okay. And uh, the process, how, how we got here basically is um, kind of offered you a ride back, and, and so we could have this conversation, and, and you gracefully accepted, and uh, off we went down uh, the 401, or the, well, the, the gardener, the QW, yeah, and the, the, the 403, and, 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 and here we are, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so just to make it clear for whoever might watch this in the future, um, we didn't force you to come with us. We didn't, uh, you know, shove you in the car and off we went kind of thing. You did it yeah. on your own free will and, and you accepted it on your own, uh, on your own decision making. Yeah. Is that no. correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I had enough and he even let me try to give money to the homeless people. So. There you go. I remember all of that. I remember all that. One of the most striking things about this interview occurs in moments like this, where Elizabeth takes the time to insist that despite actively trying to murder over a dozen people, she insists on talking about how she tried to give money to the homeless on the way to the police station. She is still concerned with being perceived as a good person, someone who would only do good deeds, and someone who, despite killing people, was somehow justified. There was no reason for her to bring up giving money to the homeless, but she is trying to impress upon the officer what a good, noble person she is, which is nonsensical given her crimes. So I I know I read you a few things before, um, as we were kind of just cruising down Spadina there, um, and I know you've been read this many times, but it's just things that we need to just reiterate and, and make sure that you're clear and comfortable with, okay. with having this conversation today. 
Okay. Okay. Um, like I said, um, based on our investigation, there could be some, some pretty serious criminal charges that result of, yeah. of our investigation. Okay. Yeah. So having said that, if, if you wish to speak to a lawyer at any time, okay. I don't want you to hesitate. We can make it happen whenever you like. So okay. whether it's now, five minutes from now, an hour from now, or three days from now, whatever the case may be. We're not going to be asking questions for three days, are we? I hope not. <laughs> okay. I'm, just, I'm just saying that any time that you want to speak to a lawyer, that you're kind of in our company or whatever the case may be, you let us know and, and we can make that accommodation for okay. you. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Okay, because you, in your position uh, as a Canadian citizen, you, uh, you're entitled to have free legal advice from a legal aid, okay. uh, duty counsel lawyer, a lawyer of your choice, whoever you like. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and like I said, because there could be some criminal charges that the result of our investigation. Right. Okay. Um, also, and I know you've been read this many times before, that you may be charged uh, with many criminal offenses, um, and you don't have to say anything in answer to the charges that you face. But if you wish to do so, um, we're going to do that today. Um, but whatever you do say could be used in, in court. And I know we had that conversation in the car on the way. On yeah. the way uh, back to Woodstock, yeah. and I asked you to repeat it in your own words, and you kind of gave us a few uh, a few of, of describing it in your own vocabulary, as you said something like, it's not Vegas, what happens in the car on the way back doesn't necessarily stay in the car, right? Yeah, so same great. thing same thing in this room, anything that you okay. say and everything that we talked about should be used as evidence at court, yep. okay? Okay. So kind of, to put it easily, the same rules apply, okay? okay? Um, and if you've spoken to any other police officers, I know that you've dealt with uh, the Toronto police Toronto, officers. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, a couple officers in the car on our, on our trip back here. Um, if anyone's persuaded you or tried to push you into making a statement, whatever they said, I don't want that to influence no. you in any way. Okay. No, what I'm about to, to say, I'm, I'm giving up my own free will. Okay. All right. And I appreciate that. Um, and we'll get moving forward. For another few things. And I know that we said this in the car, you are not under arrest right now. Okay. Okay, I want to make that very clear to you. Okay. Okay, you're not under arrest. The door is unlocked. Okay, I'm not impeding your way to the door. If you want to leave at any time, if you want to stop talking to me at any time, you just let me know. And, okay. uh, and we'll just carry on from there. Okay. Okay, but you're not being held here against your will. Uh, we're not yeah. forcing you to speak to us. Um, we just have some follow up, some. Some follow-up questions from the investigation that kind okay. of got going while you were in Toronto. Yeah, being interviewed is hard because it takes so long. It does. Um, so I'll do my best. Like if, like I said, if I have to get up and pace around a bit or whatever. If you want to take a break at any time, you let us know. If you want to get up and pace around, I'll just kind of hang tight here and yeah. and we'll just keep conversing as long as uh, as long as you're comfortable. I'll I'll go as long as I can. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um. That's kind of all the formalities, but but like I said, those are the, the things that I just wanted to make sure that were, were clear to you. And if you have any questions for me before we get started, <coughs> the floor is yours. Is there no. anything or any concerns that you have? No, I just I want to get through this and find out what happened to my mom and dad because I know they're upset because someone went to visit them today. Okay. And I visited them today and they said, you know, they're here, we're concerned, what's going on? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I can imagine. I could imagine that, and I honestly don't have those answers for you, okay. but I can get them for you. Um, okay. My role in this investigation so far has been not as in-depth as some of the other officers, um, okay. but my, my task today obviously was to travel to Toronto and, and meet with you with, with my fellow co-workers yeah. and, uh, and come back here and, and have a conversation. So that's kind of where, where I'm at right now. This is a tactic that we've seen used in multiple different interrogations, most recently the interrogation of Robert Bever. The officer will say something along the lines of, I am unaware of what has gone on, or I don't know a lot about this, as a way of telling the person that they have no preconceived bias about them or their crimes. Elizabeth knows that what she did is horrible, but if the interrogator openly admonished her, told her she was a terrible person who was going to rot in prison, she would likely clam up or try to make herself seem less horrible in her admission. Instead, by saying he has no bias against her, he can feign learning this information with her, however she presents it, and he can agree with her point of view, that some of these people deserve to die. No interrogator would go into a room without knowing the pertinent details of a case, especially not one as big as this. But I can definitely get those answers for you, and, and I don't want to upset any more people that need to be uh, 
especially your mom and dad. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you should have bought blue, t blue t tickets while you were there. You know what? If I could afford them for the playoffs, I probably would have. Yeah, that was exciting last night. Um, so just just for the record, and I know you, you prefer to go by Beth is what you told yes. me. Is that correct? Yes. Can you just state your full name for me? Elizabeth Tracy May Wetwalfer. Tracy May? Yep. Okay, and just spell your last name for the record. W-E-T-T-L-A-U-S-E-R. Perfect. Um, and Beth, the reason why we're here today is because uh, we've received some information uh, back at the end of last week um, with regards to um, some information that was provided to the Toronto Police Service, mm -hmm. um, which has led us into uh, quite a bit of work, and, and we can share today to speak to you with regards to kind of how this all started and, and yeah. follow up. But basically, um, I've, I've watched your statement that you provided to Toronto. Okay. Okay. And we've been provided uh, this document here. Does that look familiar to yes. you? Yes. Okay. All right. And from what I can see here, there's four pages of a uh, handwritten document. Is that your handwriting? Yes, it is. Okay. And it just kind of goes through um, some people that you've encountered in, in your career uh, from 2007 through to 2016 of August. Yeah. Uh, August of 2016. Okay. So so that's kind of the, the focus of our investigation right now is right. the information that you you put on these four pieces of paper. Yes. Okay. Um, but but before we get into that, I just want to kind of get an idea of, of your career and, and where you kind of where you've been in your career and um, kind of how you got into things and registered nurse. I started from call. I started from with from uh, here in Park uh, Secondary School. I um, <clears throat> I graduated grade thirteen, went for a year of law school. Not law school, sorry, journalism school. Okay. And uh, then uh, went to uh, Bible College, yeah. uh, London Baptist Bible College in London. Graduated with a degree in uh, counseling, with a bachelor's degree in counseling. Mm -hmm. And then um, discovered that that's not going to be, wasn't really going to get me a lot as far as work wise and career wise. and. So I went back to uh, here in Park High School for a year, and I took a year of math and sciences, and went on to um, Conestoga College, and in, in, uh, they have it's in Kitchener, but they have a Stratford campus, so I went there for the three years. Okay. And then when I graduated there, I worked in a place called Geraldton. Okay. Which is 16 hours north of, Sun of uh, Toronto. Like I said. Quite a bit north, isn't it? Three hours north of Thunder Bay. Yeah, that's way up there. Yes. Yeah. Um, worked there. Couldn't stand the isolation. Moved back. Worked for um, an organization called uh, Christian Horizons here in town in one of their group homes till 2007, um, at which time um, my marriage fell apart in February 2007. And... Uh, I met a woman online, okay. and she decided to move to be with me. Okay. So um, I ended up quitting the job I was at and going to Crescent Care to make a little bit more money because I was a little pregnant earner. Mm -hmm. So I started working at Crescent Care, um, I believe it was June 2007. Okay. And how long did you work there for? Until... Care as a registered nurse, yeah. and registered nurse's role is always the same, yeah. but um, I worked in different areas of the home. Okay. There's five wings to correctly care, so I worked in different areas. Right. Okay. All throughout the, the seven or so years that you were there? Yes. Okay. And at that point, did you have different supervisors from unit to unit, or uh, no, was there, there, was, the same person or? there was one supervisor. Helen Crombie, she was the head nurse. Okay. And then there was like people under her, um, Shelley, uh, Jeanette, um, I don't remember the rest of them. 
and there was like a, an administrative head. I think for most of that time it was Brenda. Right. Okay. Um, and then from Crescent Care, I know you've, you've had a few other... Yeah, I went from Crescent Care, fired from Crescent Care. Okay. For a, a medication area, era, okay. er, error. Yeah. Then from there I went to uh, Meadow Park Nursing Home. Okay. And uh, left there to get help with um, addiction issue. Okay. Hoping that it would get help with that as well. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back, I started working again in January. I left I left Meadow Park in uh, September of 2014, and I started working for a um, nursing agency called uh, Lifeguard in 2015. And I worked with them for over a year, and then in July, 2016, I started working for St. Elizabeth's Healthcare. Okay. As well, I was still working for um, Lifeguard. Oh, okay. And how did that work? Did you just split your time between the two, um, or was it just kind of a part-time position at both organizations? St. Elizabeth, Elizabeth was my priority. Okay. So, and Lifeguard is very much, you pick up the shifts as they come. There's very few scheduled shifts, so... Gotcha. I can say the yes and no to them and, and focus on the same as this. And were, and were those roles where you would do like in-home care with different um, lines? With uh, Lifeguard, it's an agency, so you go into nursing homes, you go into people's homes, you go into um, you go into uh, like retirement homes. Um, you did a lot of different things, a lot of one-on-ones with people. Mm -hmm like in their own homes, 12-hour mm -hmm. shifts, 8-hour shifts, okay. sitting with them. Okay. A lot of stuff I did was sitting with palliative patients. Right. Okay. That would be tough. I, it was okay. Yeah. Like, because mm -hmm. I knew they were going to die. Yeah. And it was just an opportunity to give the family a rest. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, it's an important role. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't see it that way and wouldn't even notice the care that these people are giving from people like yourself, right? Um, yeah. So we give the families a bit of a break and, and take, take, take that role as, as important, like, which a lot of people don't see, right? Because so. when, some, when someone's dying in the house, mm -hmm. families don't want everyone to be asleep at once, right? And that can that's be right. very hard if you're not able to do that. That's right. But if you have a nurse there that says, no, it's okay, I've got this, I know the medications I get, it's going to be all right, then... Kind of rest easy. Yeah. yeah. Nurses are incredibly selfless people to do the work that they do especially when working with the elderly. Many people, or they are nearing the end of their lives, become incredibly hostile and incoherent, and working with them is something that is incredibly taxing. However, Elizabeth giving herself this praise is telling. Again, she needs to view herself as a morally just person. She needs to believe that behind all the murders, she is a good and loving person who spends her time giving back to others. She talks about how she wants to give the families of these elderly people a break allow them some time for themselves, even though she, in most of these instances, caused severe harm to their parents. Um, back at Meadow Park, what, were you, what was your addiction? Uh, hide and rest. Okay. All right. Hide and rest. Okay. And what, like how much were you using? I was a binge user, so okay. I would use what I could get a hold of. Okay. By stealing it from the patient. Okay. All right. And how would that work? Like, would, it, would it just be in their, in their allotted medications, or would you have access to a card to, um, to feed your there dinner? Was some, <clears throat> there are some in their allotted medications. Some of them had um, confusion, so they couldn't tell the difference between what those you were giving them. So I'd give them a lot of them instead of their hydromorphs. Okay. Um, there was uh, a lot of them had as needed, so it would be in a big card, mm -hmm. and then they'd say, I would just punch out that, oh, Barney needed two of those today, and oh, Billy needed three of those today when they really didn't. Okay. And that's how I would get a hold of it. Okay. Every once in a while, there was also a um, drug, but, uh, dr big drug uh, holder, like a safe almost, that we would put the drugs in. Okay. Once, uh, like, if somebody died, yep. and there were, like, 23 hydromorphs left, would slide the whole card into the drug holder. 
Well, if you picked it up and turned it upside down and shook it, you'd get drugs back out of it. Okay. So, so you have your weight? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and was that ever an issue with, with that? Were we ever confronted? Or, or I that, was did that go totally undetected for the, the time you were there? There was a time when um, Hydromorph was delivered to the home and it didn't get put away right away by the person who should have. And so I took the hydromorph and put it in my bag and took it home. And it wasn't discovered for months. And uh, so I just played down. When the police told me about it, I played down. Yeah. And that was that? Yeah. Okay. So as a binge user then, like how much would you would you be using on a, I mean obviously you wouldn't use it on a daily basis if you're binge yeah. using, but like how long did the addiction last for? Oh, the addiction lasted from, I think it started in 2008. Okay. So to 2014, at which time I went away and got treatment at a treatment center. Okay. But then uh, I started using again probably from January 2015. I started using again. Okay. And are you still using when you get your hands on them? Or? No. Oh. No. I'm not. I'm going to stop using alcohol as well. I'm going to, I have friends in AA and I'm, I've got a very clear plan. If, if I'm able to be out and about, right. I have a very clear plan. And I also know if I'm not able to be out and about, that AA and Narcotics Anonymous do have some programs where they come into prison. Absolutely. So, yeah. that's my plan. Well, that's, that's good that you have a plan. Um, what do you think? What do you think the reason is that you slipped into the addiction back in the week? Like, what, what um, you think? Is it just the stresses of the job that you were facing, yeah, or dealing yeah, with just, your personal life as well? And just always feeling like I had to be the best possible person, and very, very stressful job, giving medications to 32 people, um, making sure treatments were done on 32 people, right. charging for 32 people, supervising four PSWs who sometimes didn't always get along. And sometimes always didn't always get along with me. Um, it's a hard job. Any nurse will say it's a hard job. I believe it 100%. And uh, then they would add different things like, oh, you have to do this and that to say who's here and counting the medications at the end of the shift. And it was a hard job. And, and I, I just, I always was putting this pressure on myself to be a really good nurse and to do everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, when I could get a hold of a hydromark or two and take it, then that pressure was gone. Right. Uh, and um, the treatment uh, center that you went away to, where was that? I cannot remember. Okay. I've tried to try to remember. Yeah. Um, was it local or? No, it was, a, it was at a town that was like two, a good two hour drive. Okay. You know where the locks are? Yeah. Near Niagara Falls. Welland. Welland? Yeah. It's a little town outside of Welland. Okay. And it, they have a, it's an 18 day treatment that they have and I, I was successful. I went through the whole thing. Nice. So all 18 days? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't successful. She completed the course but went back to using afterwards. And it helped? Yes. Yeah. Yep. What about family? I mean, you're born and raised in Woodstock? Yeah, born and raised in Woodstock, uh, married from 2000 and, er, from 97 to 2007. Okay. We broke up um, February 2007. No children. I wanted them, he never did. Okay. My mom and dad are in their 70s, 75 and 76. I have cousins all over the area, yeah. um, and uh, my brother and his wife and four kids, they live in uh, okay. and they're, um, well, they're, they're quite active. The oldest one is 26, and he's got a, a wife and two kids. He lives with his parents. They all live with the parents, except for my... Oh, is that right? Yeah, just one big yeah. house of it's crazy. family, huh? Have you been out to visit at all at Benner Beach, or? Um, I've been to see their house once. Yep. They've been here a few times. Nice. They came in 2013 for my parents' uh, 50th wedding anniversary. Nice. 
and um, my nephew and his wife stayed behind and lived with my parents for a few months while my nephew tried to go to Bible college. Okay. But he wasn't successful, so they went back. Yeah. So your brother older or younger than you? Older. Older. He's three years older than me. Okay. He's 50, 52. Um, so as far as your latest position at um, St. Elizabeth, yeah. that was your last position as a RN, is that yes, correct? Yes, it was. Okay. Yes. And you said you resigned from there? Yes. Okay. What, what brought you to that? That's, that, that's where things get a little crazy. Okay. This is part that I haven't told the doctors. Um, because it seems so stupid now. When my ex and I broke up in 2007, I was already taking the medication for my, for my borderline personality disorder. And I was so angry. And it was like a voice said inside me, I'll use you, don't worry about it. And... The different times that I have caused people's deaths or caused them discomfort through the um, through the insulin, I believe it was the influence of that voice or whatever it was. It wasn't a voice in my head, it was a voice in here. And when I would do it afterwards, I would hear like a laughter in my chest. Elizabeth could be setting up a plea of not guilty due to diminished capacity, meaning that she was not in her right mind when she committed the murders. According to Cornell Law, diminished capacity is a theory that a person, due to unique factors, could not meet the mental state required for a specific intent crime. Insanity is an affirmative defense to crimes. That is, a successful plea of insanity will, in most states, result in a verdict of not guilty and commission of the defendant to a mental institution. Diminished capacity, on the other hand, merely results in the defendant being convicted of a lesser offense. Throughout the interview, the detective's objective will now be to get her to admit that she knew right from wrong, that she was the one actually handing out the death sentences, and that she, not God, took issue with the men and women she killed. So, started working for St. Elizabeth, and I was doing well, but it was a lot of pressure, and the way that, you know, that I've helped people to die has been through insulin. And uh, after my first, my 30-day evaluation, my, uh, my uh, supervisor came to me and said, you know, I'm really sorry. We want you for Woodstock, but we have so many kids in the schools in Ingersoll that need help with their insulin pumps that you're going to start working in Ingersoll. Okay. And I panicked. I panicked. I didn't want to do that. Because I felt, you know, what if? So the kids. So about, I think it was about a week after that that I quit. Yeah. And then I, uh, packed my stuff in the car, and I drove two days into, I drove into Quebec, thinking like I would just sort of run away sort of thing, and then I thought, no, that's just stupid, so I came back, and uh, I was going to tell my parents what was going on, but they had visitors from Scotland, so I didn't tell them, I just, <laughs> sorry, spent two weeks pretending to go to work. Okay. Well, the visitors from right. Scotland were here. Right. It's funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> and then, um, once they left, I, did, I decided I didn't want to nurse anymore. I didn't want to hurt anybody anymore. So I also quit my other job. And then I decided, um, well, whatever Friday that was, that, like, I did a lot of looking into how I could get help because I realized I needed help with whatever this was. Right. Because part of me had started to believe that it was the devil. Mm -hmm. And part of me thought it might be God as a purpose through my life. And uh, I know the doctor asked me those questions, but I didn't answer them because I was so ashamed. But I just, uh, I didn't want this to keep going on. So I quit both jobs. Looked into where I could get help. Dr. Fernando is my uh, psychiatrist, and he's not a very nice man. 
So I went on an online uh, support group and was talking on to people on there, and they were saying, you know, get some help. So then I started researching some uh, site boards and stuff, and I saw CAMH, and they are the only um, mental health facility in Ontario that has an university department. Okay. So I made a decision, and I went I went there one Friday morning. I took the train, and off I went. And before I went, I told um, two I told three people what was going on. My uh, friend from AA, okay. and um, my uh, friend, uh, I told them what was going on. They said, yes, go and get help. And my friend drove me to the train station. And and when you say you told them what was going on, did you get into details I, of why I you were going to that, seek help? Or? I told them that I had been killing people to the and so I the job. And they all said, yes, you better go get help. So off I went. When these people were asked why they didn't report Elizabeth to the authorities, they claimed that they didn't believe she was being honest. People in Elizabeth's life believed that she embellished the truth in order to gain a certain amount of sympathy or attention. So when she would tell people that she killed multiple people at work and that she believed God was acting through her, they felt that she wasn't being serious. And she's friends from uh, when I used to work at Um, okay. And she drove you to the train station on, uh, on, the, on Friday, the Friday morning? Yeah. To the Woodstock train station? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then your other friend was... This is my cousin. Okay. And she's a cousin of yours? Yeah, she lives in D.C. Okay. And, I, and if you don't want to tell me, that's fine based on... The reason why this person may or may not be a friend, but your AA friend. My AA friend, yeah. Okay. She's. Her, I can tell your first name, but okay. otherwise it's confidentiality. And, and, and I don't want to dig into that uh, at this point. That's, that's not a problem at all. Um, so, did you disclose the same thing to all those three people? That I had been giving insulin overdoses. I didn't say why, because at that point I felt so stupid. It, I, it just felt so stupid. And, and Beth, to be honest with you, I, I admire your the way that you're conducting yourself and, and telling us and having this conversation with me. I thank you for that. Um, and I'm not here to judge in any way. I know. So I don't want you to know that. And, and I'm not a doctor. I know you spent a lot of time at, at CAMH the last three weeks, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm far from a doctor, but I do appreciate you, you telling me uh, the truth and, and telling me uh, the way that these things happen and played out, yeah. and, uh, and I admire you for that. And it's, you know, it's been a while because I've been stewing about, like, do I give the names of the people right. that I killed? Right. Because then here's eight families that thought that their family member died peacefully mm -hmm. and normally, mm -hmm. and they didn't, and what's that going to do to those families? Right. And even up to uh, going to the going to the hospital, I decided I was just going to give the first names, and uh, my cousin said, listen, they know what year you work there. If you don't tell them the exact names, they're going to go in there and go over every single file, and that's going to be even worse for the families there. So that she was the one to give me that advice, to give the names. And as far as you know, have these people reached out to any of police agencies where they may reside to, to notify that you told them this? Or no. Did you tell them in, in kind of confidence? And, and I told them in they confidence they and they told. said they promised me they wouldn't tell anyone. Okay. But basically the, the implying was if I didn't get help, right. then they'd be on the phone the next day. Okay. I got you. So did you tell them basically then on I told them the like, Thursday? I told them the night before I went. Okay. So yeah. Thursday night? Yeah. And then you took off Friday morning? Yeah. Okay. okay. that's... Basically, what they said was, you know, if you haven't gotten help Friday, then we're calling the police. We love you, but we're calling the police. Well, it's probably felt that they had a obligation, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Be a moral obligation, or whatever they saw, right? Yeah. What medications are you on right now? I'm taking um, fluvoxamine. It's called fluvox. 
200 milligrams. Mm -hmm. It's uh, anti-obsessional and an antidepressant. Okay. I'm taking 300 milligrams of Seroquel, which is um, an antipsychotic. Mm -hmm. And they upped that when I was at KNH, okay. which has really helped clear my thinking. Has it? Good. And then I'm taking a couple of blood pressure medications, and then I've got some loxapine for when I get really agitated. And when we left the hospital, you had taken, I believe, some Ativan, is that right? I took two milligrams of Ativan when we left the hospital. Right. Which okay. was, you guys noted the time, 1.30 yeah. or something like that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and I've had nothing since. Okay. And I know that the doctor, uh, Dr. Khan, provided with, with a prescription that... Yeah, and he up. also gave me two loxapines. Yeah. And was very strict. I am not to take them until all the interviews are over because they will start to interfere with my thinking. Okay. And then that's me to the interview. Yeah, exactly. And do you feel that you're of a clear sound mind right now? Yes, I do. Conversing with me in this, in this room? Yeah. Okay. And, and everything that you're telling me is, is the truth and the best that you can remember? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, could, I could appreciate where you're coming from as far as the work that you, you went through. Um, obviously, I've never been a nurse, and I've never worked in, in the profession that you that you did. But I could imagine how overwhelming it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, having a lot of responsibility, uh, maybe not having the support of, of the administration or your, or your supervisors. You know, just kind of go out and get it done, right? Yeah. And uh, and that could be. I can see how that would be stressful, and I can see how that would drive you maybe into your addiction and into other things. But um, I want to just go over this document, if that's okay, okay with you. Yeah. Okay, would you be willing to do that with me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you, 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 you do your thing. Sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. Absolutely not. This is pretty, excuse me, major. I've only ever had parking tickets. I've never been arrested for anything. Well, like I said, you're not under arrest right oh, now, but it is, a, it is a very significant investigation, you're right. I understand. Okay. And like I said before, Beth, I, I do appreciate you uh, speaking with us. And, Imagine that. Uh, does it feel like a weight off your shoulders? Yes. So yes you've been yes. carrying a burden for quite some time. And I've tried to get help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes it takes a few attempts to to finally commit to it, right? Yeah. I had a pastor that I told me, prayed over me, and told me I'd be fine, and that was God's grace. And then. When was that? That was uh, Halloween, 2013. And you, you kind of divulged to what had happened to your to you uh, to that point in your life with yes. involving these people. Yeah. Okay. And where was that? That was here in town. Okay. Do you want his name? If you want to tell me, it's up to you. That was, oh no, sorry, it wasn't. Did I just say 2014? It was 2013. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so be, before we get into this, um, I know that there's a statement which we have and that I've watched where you attended the police station in Toronto at the yes. 52 Division. Is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And I honestly, I think it was Detective Hamilton, and I honestly can't remember any other detective's name. Now I know it started with an A. Um, and you met with them for. Uh, an hour and a half. I was going to say about an hour and a half. That was not. <laughs> And at that point, you had in your possession um, a photocopy of this document, yeah, right? Okay. And you went through and you read it out. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then following that, they started uh, with the first name on the list, and they wanted to just try and get a little bit more detail of, yeah. of, of the involvement in each circumstance, okay. in each death, right? Okay. That's what I'd like to do today and just get some more detail. Okay. Okay. So. It's a long list. It is. It is, but I think that you and I, I think we can get through it together. Yeah, I'm and, sure we can. As long as you're patient with me. I'm, I've got all the time to look. Okay. I'm not going anywhere. Because I'm physically comfortable. It's a nice chair, but... Yeah. Well, at, anytime yeah. you need to get up and wander around, if you, like I said, if you want to take a break and uh, have me leave and just kind of stretch your legs and whatever the case may be, you go ahead. Okay. okay. If you have to use your washroom at any time, just let me know. All right. Okay? Because like I said, I'm, I'm here as, as long as we need to be. 
Okay. Okay, I'm not pressuring you to uh, to stay longer than you want to, but I think that uh, I think if we just kind of sit down and go through this, like I said, we'll get through it together. Yes. I'm uh, I'm a pretty patient person, and I'm here to just listen to what you have to tell me. Okay. Okay. Okay, and like I said, I I appreciate it. Okay. So, um, how about we just do this together? I'll just bring this over okay. here. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So I'm not going to have you read through this entire document because I've already ha you already did that, right? I have written it. I have read it. I have, you know, lived it. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, Mr. Silcox. Yes. Yeah. Okay, September of 2007. Yeah. Okay. The first one that died as a result of what I did. Okay. And and before you get into that, you have signed some kind of page numbers, all that kind of stuff on yeah. these documents. So we'll just go in order of, of how you've written it, okay? And I know that the detectives in uh, in Toronto kind of had this in their possession and just kind of got you to recall some things. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just going to keep it here because, I mean, you've already written this out. So yeah. what's on here is we already know that. Um, I just have some follow-up questions okay. with, just with regards to each circumstance. So Mr. Silcox, um, it says here you were working at double shift uh, from 3 to 7, right? 3 p.m. to 7 a.m. Right. Okay. And this was at Crescent Care? Yes. Okay, in Woodstock. Yes. Okay. And tell me about your, your knowledge of, of James and, and your daily interactions during a shift with him. Um, I didn't see him every time. He wasn't always my patient. I just knew from what uh, people had said that he would grab the, the nurse's uh, breasts and buttocks and he would say horribly inappropriate things about his wife that now he was there, you know, um, he was going to fuck all of us. She was going to fuck all of us. Uh, just would say different things, and he did touch me inappropriately once. And where was that? On, on your body? Breast. On your breast. Okay. And were you alone in the room at that point? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, did he have a roommate at all? Did you have I, a roommate? I, he must have. He wasn't in a single room. So he was either in a double room or a quadruple room. Okay. Would you remember any other residents that would be roomed with him at that time? Or? No. No. Okay. No. That's okay. Um, what portion of the home would, would, was James in at this point? He was in the, okay, the east wing, the south wing, north wing. He was in the north wing, mm -hmm. so halfway down, and he was either in a double bed or a quadruple bed. Okay. Right. And um, the, the diagnosis of, of his health at the, at the time you were caring for him, do you remember? He was post-hip surgery and he had dementia. Do you remember how old he was approximately? No, I don't. I didn't see him in his 80s. In his 80s? Yeah. Okay. And, sorry, he was not a diabetic? Not a diabetic. And, sorry, you said he had dementia? Yes. Okay, which you've also noted here as well, right? Yes. Okay. So tell me about the night. Uh, was this the first person that you did this to? That I, that I tried. Well, there were other people that I did it to who didn't die. Prior to James? Prior to James. Okay, and he's is it documented on here? He's the first one who died. Right. Uh, Back here? But there's some other... People who didn't die. Right, so I can't read that first name. I've but till they agree in Okay, so that was, I mean, they're both September oh, 2007, but that was yeah. before James? Yeah. Okay. So was this your first attempt at, at overdosing these people on insulin? Yes, Quintilla was. It was And I didn't really want her to die. I just, I don't know, I was just angry and um, had this sense inside me that she might be a person that God wanted back with him. I was angry and I got the sense inside me that this is a person that God might want back with him. This statement is important as she takes ownership of her actions instead of putting them on God. She wasn't being told by God to kill. She wasn't being controlled by an outside force. She was angry at this person and thought that maybe they should die because of that. Any chance of arguing diminished capacity would be weakened by this statement. And is that that feeling you're referring to that you had in your stomach sometimes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is that is that the point? And I hate to get off a topic here, but the point where you had these feelings in your stomach and almost that laughter after it happened. Yeah. Is that the part that you didn't tell Dr. Khan? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to be clear on that. I told him about the laughter in my stomach, but not the feeling that. This may be the person that God wants. Okay. Okay. I just found it so stupid. It's your feelings, right? Mm hmm I honestly felt like God wanted to use me. And he kept, Dr. Khan kept asking me, do you think God chose me for a special purpose? I kept saying no, because that did not sound like a special purpose. 
you know. Yeah. So, but yeah, I just had a sense after my marriage broke up that God was going to use me for something. And then after a while, I started to really wonder after some of the murders, if it was God or if it was the devil fooling me. Did you feel like you were doing the right thing for these people? No. No. I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do, but it wasn't what was right for them. Okay. Um, so, James, then, um, it was an evening that this one took place, right? Yeah. Um, it says here at about 9.30. Yeah. Run me through... How about 930, I gave him a dose of uh, 50 milligrams of insulin, he's not, not diabetic. So I went into, a, I used a borrowed insulin pen, borrowed insulin, and gave him an insulin shot. And at 330, the PSW, well, throughout the night he was yelling out, I love you and I'm sorry. And not, to, not to me, but just you could hear him calling out in his room, and that's what he was calling out. Mm-hmm. And then at 330, the uh, PSWs came to me and said that he was gone. So I did what we're supposed to do. I went and listened to his heart and chest, called the doctor, called the family because that's what they wanted. Family came in to sit with him for a while. Doctor came in and uh, said that his cause of death was from um, an embolism due to his uh, post hip. He'd had a he'd had hip surgery. Doctor ruled that embolism due to post hip surgery. Um, who do you think he was talking to when he was yelling, out, I love you? I thought it might be his, his family. Okay. I really did. And when they came in and talked to me, they wanted to know if he'd said anything. Right. So I told them that I was so ashamed. Yeah. So ashamed. She was not ashamed, but she knows that to say she spoke to the family and accepted praise for being a wonderful caretaker and nurse for them is awful. And she wants to make sure that the detective likes her. And is that the uh, the family that kind of commended you for the work that you had done? And yes, and that I've been there for them. And yes. How did that make you feel? Awful. Yeah. Absolutely awful. How did you deal with it? Um, I just went home and went to bed. You know, I felt awful. Maybe I fought with my girlfriend. Did some exercising, you know. Yeah. Did some games on the computer and just tried to forget about it. Did you have a, uh, have a problem sleeping that night at all, or, you know, um, or did you? Well, I was working nights, so I was... Um, you were during the day, then? Um, I would say I tossed and turned a bit, yeah. It felt pretty bad. And I didn't want to see the family again. So I tried to make sure I wasn't working when they came to pick up their stuff, and I wasn't. And what room? Do you remember, the, like, a room number, or just... Like no, it was down in our front. The wing, yeah. Okay. When you in, where did you get the insulin from for James, for Mr. Stilcox? You said you had taken some insulin. Um, where did you get those? The insulin was kept in a fridge in the medication room. Okay. We had two medication rooms. Okay. Insulin was kept in a fridge in the medication room, and uh, extra pens were kept in the drawer. So you could just say somebody who had someone admitted and you needed a pen in a hurry. So you just put the insulin in the pen and, and put the needle on and dial up the dose and give it. And how was that documented to know that, so that Crescent Care would know that you were taking that insulin? They didn't keep track of insulin. Okay. So it was just a, something that was available for the nurses use when they knew that it was appropriate for the certain patients? Yes. Now each patient has their own insulin. Right. And maybe somebody noticed, somebody may have noticed that a lot of insulin was missing. Yes. A lot was used, but I was always careful to use different people. Okay. Different people than insulin? Insulin, yes. Okay. All right. And Mr. Silcox, then, where, where did you inject the insulin into his body? I'm not really sure. I'm going to say his arm or his uh, torso. And did he know what was going on at that point? Not really. Was he uh, was he a verbal patient? Like could he could converse oh, yeah. with you he, and he communicate? He didn't really converse. He did a lot of yelling out. I don't really remember him reacting when I gave it to him. So he didn't react. I I don't remember him reacting. No. Okay. Would he maybe just think it's a, a regular portion of his day and Probably. receiving the medications that he he so required? Probably the yeah, dementia. Is there anything else you can remember about Mr. Silcox? Um, his wife and 
not a love in the law. And how does that make you feel? Crappy. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, like I said, he could be a bit of a handful. But, you know, he ate and drank normally. He took his pills when he told him to. So, nothing else I can really remember about him. But this is, you know, nine years ago. So. so, a while ago. Yeah. How long after, sorry, when did you break up with your, your husband? Is I it, broke up with August him. August 2007? Oh, no, no. I broke up with him in the uh, end of January, beginning of February 2007. Okay. Okay, so it was quite some time until September until you actually... Yeah. All right, I guess. By that time, I was in a new relationship with a woman. Okay. Who was that? Her name was Maureen. Maureen. Okay. Um, did you ever disclose to her what you were doing? No, absolutely not. So you just kind of went about your thing with Mr. Silcox? Yeah. Um, went home that... Day, did your kind of some exercise and computer games, went to sleep. Did you work again that next day? I don't remember. Don't remember. Do you remember who you would have been working with on that occasion? No. No? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Do you want to get yeah. up and stretch? I just do a lot of fidgeting. Okay, that's okay. Hey, you're not bothering me. I just want to make sure that you're comfortable. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. If I need something, I'll do it. Okay. You betcha. Do you remember who your supervisor would have been at that point? Well, that would be Helen Rombay. That was the head nurse? Yeah, she was always, like, whoever was on as the nurse was the charge nurse. Okay. So I was the charge nurse. Mm -hmm. And at night, so I, as the charge nurse from 3 to 11, I was in charge of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 PSWs. Mm -hmm. And I was a, yeah. And then... There was two other wings, and so at night, as a church nurse, I was responsible to look after the um, RPN on the other side, like the reserve server. Okay. There were four PSWs on that side and four PSWs on my side, so nine people. Okay. And then Mrs. Prombe, of course, she was the rank mate. Okay. She's yeah. yeah. But she's who we all, she's who we all answered to. Okay. She was... Her and the executive director, Brenda, I can't remember her last name. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm probably going to pass gas for this today. That's fine. So, as far as Mr. Silcox goes then, besides what you were feeling in your stomach, and besides that you thought that this was a purpose that you were given on from your relationship for after breaking up with your husband, right? Yeah. That you, that you, you, you indicated that he wasn't a very nice man. No, he wasn't. Did, is that a portion of um, what happened? I don't know. Okay. I wonder if that's a portion of how I chose him. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I did feel a release and a relief. Mm -hmm. Like a relief of pressure. Okay. Because throughout this document, and, and as we go through it, a lot of these people, you kind of describe them as, as not very nice people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's a tendency or a pattern that we see as far as, is that why you chose these people? Yeah, I'm not, it might be, but I also know I just felt like they were the ones. Right. I had a feeling inside that they were the ones. Before before you injected insulin to Mr. Silcox, was it a spur of the moment thing? Had you thought about it that uh, when you reported for duty at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Um, I started thinking about it about 6 at night, I think. And do you remember who the pronouncing doctor would have been? No. Like how, did that, how did that process work? That process, the way it worked was a uh, person found with no vital signs. Nurse goes in with a stethoscope, mm -hmm. listens for one minute. If there's no heartbeat, no uh, lung sounds, nurse goes and calls the doctor on call. Okay. Um, there was also a sheet that we had to fill out if we thought it was a coroner's case. In this case, I don't believe we thought it was. And then um, family is called. And the doctor may wait to come in and uh, pronounce in the morning. Oh, okay. 
family can come in and visit the body at any time. Okay. So then the PSWs would get the the body ready. Okay. So prior to the doctor announcing in the morning, the family could come in and yeah. spend time. Yeah. So the PSWs would just clean them up, put on uh, you know clean clean bridges and right. clean up the bed and stuff. Right. So you said you said Mr. Silcox, you said we didn't think it was a coroner's case. Who who who's it? Oh, what have that been? I guess I'm using the royal we. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Okay. So would that be just a decision that you were trying um, to make? No, there's a there's a form okay. on the computer, and you go down through it. And if it says if you take off anything that says yes, you notify the coroner. Okay. All right. But you would have clicked off those boxes yourself. Yes. Okay. So obviously, knowing that you had done this to Mr. Silcox, did you feel that you wouldn't click yes so that attention wouldn't be drawn to you? You know, I honestly can't remember if he was a coroner case or not. Okay. He might have been. Now, would insulin... In I would... I, even though I did this to these people, when I did their... But see, it's, it's phrased as, does anyone have a reason to believe that this death was not natural? Right. So, yeah, I would click... I wouldn't click that one. If I right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. And I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah.
And do you remember what part of the body he would have been injected in? Oh, maybe the leg. Because at that point he didn't have a lot of body fat. So. Murray's didn't know. He didn't know. And when you get a, a subcutaneous injection, it goes in to the body fat. So. Okay. And you documented that he was a cancer patient? Yes. Okay. Do you remember what type of cancer he had? I think it was prostate. Prostate? Prostate, yes. Yeah. Okay. And what was the what did the outcome uh, hold for his future as far as the, the cancer in his body? He was dying. Awesome. How old do you think Maurice was? 75, 76. Okay. Right. I'm sorry, he was in a double room? Yeah, I believe it was a double room, yeah. Okay. Do you remember who you had been working with that day? No. Same supervisor or the head nurse? No. Sorry, I'm... That's I, okay. So far... It's a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a significant event in your life, but it's a yeah. long time ago. Yeah. So, I, I, no, I'm not, I don't, I'm not concerned that you can't remember every question that I ask you. That's, you just, if you can do the best that you can, that's all I can ask for. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else you can remember about uh, Maurice at all? Not really, no. No. Okay. Do you know if he was a coroner's case? There were people who left them, that's what I remember. I don't know who was going to say it. Who loved Maurice? Who did you know that would he come had, visit him? He had friends that would come and visit him. That were like family too. Mm-hmm. A man and a woman that all I remember. And how did it make you feel when, when Maurice passed away? Not good. And what happened from there? Just I just, uh, well, mm-hmm. I wasn't there when he passed away. I, d- I didn't work that day. Do you remember if you worked the next day? I might have. I know when I found out that he died, I looked to see how long it took and I get rid of the notes and stuff to see what it got. Okay. And just getting a point out to fit it with. Yeah, no problem. Whatever you need. Um, so after you found out he had passed, you kind of read through the documents and... Yeah. Do you remember seeing anything that kind of said, oh, you know... No. This isn't a good thing for me or... No. Okay. So... And even if I had, I couldn't have altered them. You could have, or could not. Could not. Okay. Um, the next person on your list is Helen Matheson. Yeah. Okay. So you go from September or October to '07. Yeah. And then Helen was 2011. Yeah. What What happened between those years? I think um, you'll see that they. Was there some attempts? Attempts. Okay. Um, you know where you know right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we'll get to those. Yeah. Okay. Helen, I don't remember a lot about. She was very quiet, very determined. Um, just seemed to be waiting to die. Mm-hmm. Again, I had that feeling that, you know, this is the one. Mm-hmm. And um, I made a bit of a fuss about her that night because she was very lucid. Mm-hmm. And we talked about how much she liked blueberry pie and ice cream. Okay. So on my on my break I went to uh, Walmart. I got a small blueberry pie and some ice cream mm-hmm. and brought it to her and she ate three or four bites. Yes. And then that night I overdosed her. Cause, like I said, I had that feeling that it was her time to go and. What do you mean by that? Do you think she was towards the end of her life at that point? No, that she was the person to go to. Okay. And that was in your mind, in your stomach. In Where my, was that feeling? In my chest in area. Your chest. After I did it, I got that laughter. Okay. When would you feel that laughter? Would you feel it right after you injected it, or once the person passed away? Um, both. Yeah. Both. Okay. And Helen was, uh, you did hear that she wasn't a diabetic? No. Okay. Just out of curiosity, how much insulin would it take to kill someone See, that know. wasn't a diabetic? Or I don't know. You don't know that? No. So it's kind of hitting that. You didn't know that as a nurse, that this amount? Or no, there is no that amount. Okay. And I'm just, I, I, I just yeah. simply just don't know that yeah, answer. There is That's no right. that amount. Okay. All right, so different people would react differently to different amounts, is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it would obviously make a difference if they were diabetic or not a diabetic? Yeah. Right. I believe she died the next day. Okay. And it said, uh, I don't hear the doctor declared her to be a palliative. And she died two days later. Two days later, okay. And do you remember how much insulin that you had given her? Sixty. 
know. And where would you have gotten that from? From from the same supplies same. I always get it. Okay. Do you remember where Helen was in, in Crescent Care? Yes, she was on the south wing and probably about four doors down from the nurse's station in a double room on the right hand side. If you were facing the end, she was on the right hand side. Um you don't say a lot of negative things about Helen here. Did you did you get along with her okay? Did she ever do anything to, to harm you or No, no, she was very quiet. It was just I got that feeling that this you know, she's next to the time to go. And uh, her health at that point, what was her diagnosis? She was, um, I couldn't tell you her diagnosis, just that she was, she didn't get out of bed a lot, and she had to be fed her food and fed her pills. So she was, she was near her end of life. How oh, old do you think Helen was when this happened? Just say about 85 or 86. Do you remember what doctor would have were you there when she passed away the two days later? I don't think so. You don't think so? So you won't wouldn't be which which doctor pronounced her even no. too sure. Once I gave the insulin overdose, unless I was there for the ship that died, I just kind of laid low and didn't you know, have anything to do with them. So so if you issued an insulin injection to somebody, Helen for instance, do you remember where Helen was injected? Probably her arm. Okay. Um, so, do you remember if she had a reaction at all? A reaction? Mm -hmm. Did you know if she confronted you in what you were doing at all? Was she able to... She might have said, ow. Was she used to getting insulin or needles? I don't know or? if she was. Okay. Um, but she wasn't combative or, or mm -hmm. she didn't confront you and ask you what you were doing? No. And you said once once you gave them their insulin? You just, I just kind of, I tried to stay away from it. Sometimes I was very interested to see what was happening. Mm -hmm. I would just try to stay away from it. Okay. Would you ever go back into their rooms if while they were still alive to see kind of how they were progressing through the... If they were, if they were my, if they were my uh, charge, yes, I had to. Okay. Even though you had attempted to take their lives? Yeah. Okay. And you would, um... What kind of symptoms would they show? Is it different for everyone? Or? Um, well, usually they get very diaphoretic, red. Um, they could lose consciousness. They'd shake. Some people, um, one person had a seizure. I think it was just one person. Mm -hmm. Two people stroked right out. Right after receiving the... Not yeah. right after, but they stroked out. Over time. Actually, three people, because they believe James stroked it as well. So. Mr. Stokos. Mr. Stokos, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, November 2011. Mm-hmm. Mary Zerwinski, is that yeah. how you recall uh, her last name being pronounced? Yeah. And this was at Crescent Care? Yeah. Okay, and you said that she wasn't a diabetic, but she had dementia? That's right. But she could talk and communicate a lot. Mary could. Yeah, she was she was uh, feisty. Was well, she? Yeah. She didn't hurt the nurses or anything. She was just very outspoken and feisty. And one night she said, "You know, I'm gonna die tonight." Mary said that. Yeah. And I said, "Oh." And she said, "Yeah. Why don't you get me into the Why don't you get me into the deathbed so I can die?" And I said, "Are you sure?" And she said, "Yeah. Put me to bed. I'm gonna die." So I said, okay, and I went to the other nurse that was working with me, and uh, she said, oh, okay, well, let's put her inside this care room if that's what you want. So we did, and then I thought, well, she must be the next one. Mm -hmm. I had a feeling inside of me she must be the next one. Because she was saying she was going to die, but there was no sign she was going to die. So I gave her an overdose of insulin. And she became palliative and she died. I think it's been a couple of days. I think. Yeah, so she's died in the next afternoon is what you can even know about here. But, um, oh, oh perfect. Sure. There you go. Which one has the vodka in it? <laughs> no 
no answer from them. If you were to think about what someone confessing to murder looks like, you likely wouldn't think of someone cracking jokes throughout. And yet, here we are. Again, Elizabeth really wants the interrogator to like her and to think she is a funny, good person. Her behavior is completely out of sync to what she is doing, and it's no wonder most of the people she confessed to didn't believe her. Um, so... Um, where was that in relation to where she was? Like, where was Mary and, and Chris? She there? was down the south wing, a couple of rooms down from the, the uh, down from the nurse's office. And, uh, she, yeah, so she, we did put her in the pie of bed. And would that be a decision that you would make or someone else would have to make? Together we made it. Okay. But a supervisor um, yeah. wouldn't have to say, okay, no. go ahead and... No, we have... We had enough autonomy that if we thought someone was um, quieted, we could call the doctor, tell them what was going on, mm -hmm. move, them, move the person to the palliative bed, mm -hmm. and get orders for palliative care. Okay. And do you remember how much insulin you would have given Mary? I think she may have been the first person that I gave long acting and short acting to together. Okay. I think. And can you just, well, besides the actual obvious. Uh, in the uh, title of the, the actual drug itself, long acting and short acting, what was the biggest difference between the two? One one drops your blood sugar right away, the other um, starts working through your body and dropping it gradually over a long period of time, and it just keeps dropping it. Okay. And what would the combination of those two do together? Uh, Did you know? Much, I didn't know for sure, but I figured it would be much stronger than just the short acting. Right. Well, we had moved her from the double room to the uh, palliative care room, right okay. in her corner from the nurse's office. So where did you inject her? In the palliative bed? Or in her? the palliative bed. Okay. And she, she had vocalized to you that she thought that she was going to die that night? Yeah. So I said, okay, she must be the one. When I gave the insulin, I got that feeling inside in the laughter. Has she ever said something to, like, something to you before about wanting to die? Not like that. No, she was like, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die tonight. I'm being dead, I'm going to die. And that was new to you? Yes. Do you remember what shift you were working? Afternoons, 3 to 11. Okay. And about what time do you think you would have moved her into the palace of bed and injected her? Um, might have been after supper, so about 7. And Mary ever dying to harm you or... No. Upset you in any way? No. No, she was fun. Okay. She was, so she was funky and, and outspoken. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you remember being present when she died? I don't think I was. Okay. Right. And therefore probably wouldn't be a part of checking the boxes? No, no, I didn't do the boxes for her. Who was there to see Mary on a regular basis? Who came to see Mary? I don't know. No. I don't know. Do you know if she had family? Um, maybe a son, but I don't know. And, and Mary being, we'll refer to her as your fourth victim. Mm, yes. Yeah. Not the fourth person that, uh, well, that you were successful in, uh, and these insulin injections. How did your emotions start to, to feel as it um, kept continuing? I kept having a lot of guilt. A lot of guilt. Um, Mary, well, 
as you'll see, after Mary was Gladys and after Gladys there was a period of two years where I didn't do it. Three years where I didn't do it. What was going on in your life at that point? I was trying very, very hard to get close to God to make sure that this wasn't Him and to just live my life, read the Bible, go to church and not do that because I didn't want to do it anymore. So I tried very hard. I'm still using a little bit. The hydromorphs? Yeah. And alcohol? Yeah. What was your drink of choice? Rye. Yeah. So I shouldn't say it like that, but I make it sound like it's... Yeah, rye. Would you... Rye and Bailey's. Yeah. Yeah, pop a rye and pop down some water. Yeah. Yeah, rye and water. Okay. And, uh... Typically, how much would you, would you drink in a week? In a week? Probably about eight or nine. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like shots of rye or? Uh, drinks. So I don't know. Okay. Shot. Okay. If you're going to go buy shots, I know if you're doing drinks, so like three times nine, 27. Okay. So like you'd be drinking triples? Yes. Okay. How would that make you feel with, in combination with the hydromorphs? And uh, I never did it with the hydromorphs. No, it was no, either one or the other. Either one or the other. Okay. The, the booze is more just for one I didn't have. Mm -hmm. The hydromorphs. Mm -hmm. And if I was going out, but I didn't go out with people. I always went out mostly by myself and just, I took scratch and one tickets and took booze and yeah. I would drink and do my scratch one. Yeah. Okay. Um. As significant and disturbing as this may be to the people that are going to hear this and, and, and learn about this, obviously there's a lot of uh, families that we're going to contact yes. and, and speak to. Um, although this wasn't, and I hate to classify it into different areas, but these weren't necessarily violent deaths. Like, how did, Do you think these people died peacefully? Did they struggle at all? Um, all the people you've talked about so far died peacefully, in my opinion. None of them died peacefully. As we've covered, some of these deaths took days, with the victims having seizures, strokes, and losing their ability to speak and communicate. The idea that their deaths weren't agonizing is entirely untrue. And I am sorry. I'm sorry for what the families went through at the time, and I'm extremely sorry for what they're going to go through. I, it's awful. If you could say something to them, what would you say? What can you say to them? That would matter. Um, I'm sorry isn't enough. I should have gotten help sooner. Um, I took something from you that was precious and it was taken too soon. Um, I honestly believed at the time that God wanted me to do it. But I know now that's not true. And uh, if I could take it back, if I could get help sooner, I would have. And that's sorry. Like I said, I admire you for every, whether it took one year, two years, ten years, whatever it took for you to finally get help. That's, that's a big step. Oh, thank you. Right? I mean, you could have been in this situation and, and taken this to your grave. Yes. And who would have known? Right? That's what I was told to do by a lawyer. What's that? Take it to my grave and not tell anybody. So you've confided in a lawyer as well about this? A long time ago, yeah. Was it after all of these people? It, it was in 2014 before I... Uh, like before you went to Welland? Or, yeah, sorry, to the, the Welland rehab center? Or, yeah, to the rehab center. So you spoke to a lawyer? I spoke to a lawyer. And that, she was the one who told me to get out. Um, I need to go to the no. Just for the record, and uh, so it's documented, I have 6 is 26. Let's yeah. take a break, okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Cool. All set? Yeah. Do you need anything else at all? No. Are you sure? No, I have a caramel. Oh, did you? Perfect. Um. Just for the record here. Um.
I have <coughs> six that are D, and that'll just resume things, okay? Okay. Okay? Yep. Okay. We're going to carry on? Yep, that's cool. Awesome. So, Gladys. So this takes us to November of 2011 mm -hmm. at Crescent Care. Um, it says here Gladys was a type 2 diabetic um, and had dementia. Severe dementia. Did she? Yeah. How old do you think Gladys was? Nine, 92. 92. Okay. And where was Gladys within uh, Crescent Care? East Wing, um, three doors down from the main desk in a double room. Okay. Do you remember her roommates at all? No. No. Um, and and uh, obviously these are repetitive questions, and yeah. you might remember some of the roommates through uh, as we go along here. So that's why I just keep asking the same questions. Um, tell me a little bit about Gladys. What did you what was she like when you um, cared for her? Well, when I first started caring for her, she was walking and talking, and she had quite the spirit. Um, mm -hmm. She once <laughs> she once punched a man oh. because uh, she, she overheard the nurses. Telling one of the gentlemen, no, you can't push your wife around, you have to come with us. And she turned around and she said, you can't treat a woman like that. Boom! And hit the man. And hit the man. <laughs> so then we're all in a state of trying to keep them from fighting with each other and trying to keep them from hurting us. So right. Yeah, she was oh. very smunky. But she went down, downhill fast. Did she? Eventually, um, she, was, she had um, dementia. Didn't take her pills well, didn't eat well, very stubborn woman. And uh, as always, one evening I just got that red surging feeling that she was going to be the one. Mm -hmm. And um, gave her insulin overdose. Did you ever get that feeling outside of work? No, never. No? Did you ever get that feeling going to work, knowing that something was going to happen that shift? No, it always happened at work. So. If I were to use the phrase spur of the moment, would it be something that you would just have that feeling come on? Or yeah, I guess you could say it up for the moment, but it would it usually start happening, you know, focused on one patient, and then I would feel that red surging, which is what made me think it was God. Which I'm so embarrassed. Like I said, I'm not here to judge you. Right? I know. Right? I know. Um, and you explained that it was difficult for her towards the end giving her her pills. Um, do you remember what you were working with uh, the shift when you injected glass? I believe I was working, I was either working night or days. Okay. Because I know it was close to the end of my shift. Okay. They did it, and the person who came on next shift, I think it was night. So the person who came on next shift checked her all over and started to call the doctor and had her made palliative and started her on a pain, pain regimen and... and... Do you remember how much insulin you gave her? No, I don't. Do you remember if it was long or short or a mix? I, I probably, at that point, I think I was giving everybody a mix. Okay, so once once Mary was the first person you said yeah. that you gave the, the long and the short acting Yes. Yeah. And then following that, it was... Everything. Everyone from there yeah. forward. Um, and that was, a, again, a crescent care. Yeah. Was that insulin taken from the same location as, yeah. as you always would? Yes. Yeah. Is there cameras in, in, in the bedroom? Bedroom? No. No? No. Nothing at all? No. Okay. So you could access whatever you like and... Well, not whatever you like, but yeah. But the insulin, because the insulin. they didn't even keep track of it. Um, the insulin, uh, yeah. The insulin, um, you could get volume, you could get, like, injectable volume. Um, yeah, it's fairly easy to take meds from there. Um... We'll get into, sorry, I was going to ask you a question, but we didn't get down the road. Um, you know how long it took for Gladys to die? I believe she died the next afternoon, or that afternoon. Okay, and you know if you were present for that? No, I was not. So therefore, it wouldn't have been a part of the, the process of, of the pronouncing and checking the boxes? No, the boxes. no. Um, when someone's dying, it seems like it takes longer than it does. If you're around, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that you don't know. Thank you. Um, as far 
course class goes, do you remember if you worked the next day to, to learn about Glass of Death? Or? Um, I think I worked two days later. Okay. I think I worked the day after her death, whenever that was. Okay. What would play through your mind on, on your days where you inject, so Glass, for instance, you inject her, uh, you work nights, it says here, so yeah. 11 till 7, you did this at 5 o'clock, you go home and carry it on about if you have one, two, three days off, whatever yeah. the case was. What was going through your mind on those I days off? Were you thinking when yeah. when Gladys going to die? I would wonder if she had died. I would wonder, you know, if this would be the time I would get caught. Mm -hmm. You know, what was I going? Every time, every time I walked in after somebody had passed away, I always wondered if this day I'm going to get caught. Mm -hmm. What kind of consequences play through your head? Like if you. If Damn, I'm, I'm caught in the gigs up. What, what kind of consequences do you think yeah. you're going to face if, if that were to happen fired. back in 2011? Fired, jail, um, no more nursing license. That's exactly what I'm looking at now. Although I took myself out instead of being fired. But right. Jail and no more nursing license. As far as in 2011, though, and, and, and having that feeling, like when did those feelings start to say, in your mind, like, I wonder if this is the time I'm going to get caught. Probably it happened right at Mr. Soapbox, or did it? Yeah, yeah, probably every time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Gladys, do you think, uh, did she have a reaction when you injected her? She fought a little bit. Did she? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Like, she struggled around, so I, I found a spot on her leg that I could do where she couldn't reach me and pinch me. Okay. Would that be something difficult if you were giving her medication she'd like yeah. to pinch? Pinch, scratch, feel up her mouth. Is that common patients? Um, yeah. 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 Okay. And um, like even the, the PSWs who had to change her uh, product, mm -hmm. sometimes she'd fight them and scratch them and pinch them and twist their hair and yeah. And do you think that played into any part of your actions with Gladys? Um, Particularly with Gladys? I don't know. I think some of the, the um. I think some of it did, you know, the stubbornness and stuff, and yeah, just kind of, okay, you're the next one to go. But again, there was always that red surging that I identified as God telling me, this is the one. You know, this is how you work for me. Did you ever try and fight that feeling? Later on, as you'll see. Mm -hmm. okay. But when you got that feeling, in your chest and, and stomach, would you would you directly go to get the insulin? Um, pretty much. As soon as I had time with the rest of my job. How many patients would you be caring for during, on one shift? Thirty-two. You'd be responsible for all thirty-two. Yeah, thirty-two. So each nurse would have thirty-two. Yeah, nurse. Uh, our registered practical nurse, registered practical nurse. Okay. So that's a busy day. Mhm. Mm and I know we talked about it earlier, but again, just to revisit that, do, do you think that's something that played into this? I think the so. The stresses of the job? I, oh, yeah, I definitely think Because you had a lot going on in your life. Yeah, I definitely think that stress played into it. Maybe made, me, made my mind more susceptible to mm -hmm. stuff. Did you ever go to work um, intoxicated by alcohol or drugs at all? Um, no. Did you ever use at work? Yes. The hydromorphs? Yes. Okay. Often. Awesome. Probably once or twice a week. Yeah. Yeah. And when you were at Crescent Care, where would you get the higher marsh from? Oh, there's a number of ways you can get them. Right. You can sign off that somebody got their sign off that somebody won the PRN mm -hmm. and take it instead. Okay. You can uh, take them their regular medication and if they're not able to identify it, mm -hmm. take it instead. You can take the regular medication that's in capsules, and if they are able to identify it, open the capsule, take the stuff out, mm -hmm. put the capsule back together again, give them the empty okay. capsule, take it yourself. And how would you typically adjust the hydromorphs? I just swallowed it. I never shot it. I never snorted it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And do you remember how much you gave Gladys? Of the insulin? Mm hmm I think I gave her 80 60. I think. And her reaction after after she kind of pinched and, and struggled a little bit with you? She relaxed and then um, by the time the next nurse came on she was red, she was sweating, she was incoherent. She, 
Her blood slides, her vital signs are all down. And how do you know that? Because I was just leaving when the next nurse came on and she, CSWs came to her and she said something's going on with Gladys and she, she said, come with me, we have to go check on Gladys. And so, yes, yeah, so I actually helped her move Gladys to the palliative care room. Okay. Here knows my gourd the whole time. <laughs> That she was going to say was something I did. Thinking, okay. Was she still able to communicate at that point? No. Okay. Do you remember what nurse that was that you moved? Karen? Advice? I don't remember her last name. If I sit for a minute, if I sat for a minute, I could probably remember. Okay. Well, if it comes to you, um, it might just be one of those things that pops in your head in a few moments, right? Yeah. Rutledge. Karen Rutledge? Yeah. Yep, as far as I know. Okay. Mrs. Helen Young. So this is where you have a bit of a gap again. Yeah. 2011 to 2013 with your successful yeah. injections. But there was, and there wasn't even any attempt. No. Yet. No, if I'm in November 2011. I came home from a uh, cruise of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and I was feeling guilty, I was feeling damned, I was feeling confused, I, I was feeling like I just didn't want to do it anymore, I was feeling like if I could somehow connect with God strongly enough that I wouldn't do it anymore, and so I spent a lot of time reading my Bible and praying and deciding I just wasn't going to do it anymore. So, I had the odd urge to do it, but I resisted by going to church, reading my Bible, praying, and telling God I didn't believe him that he wanted me to do it anymore. What church were you going to do that one? Um, Um, so as far as fighting off that, do, would you still have that feeling, like that burning feeling? Sometimes, but I I did a lot of praying about it, and I would I just did a lot of praying, reading my Bible, getting very involved in my in my faith, getting very involved in my church. Right. Okay. And obviously, with what you've told us so far, that it helped. Yeah. From what you've documented. Yeah. Is there anything else that we need to be aware of that happened in between those times? No. Okay. No. Okay. I didn't tell anybody or anything like that. Okay. Except for the, the pastor, sorry, what did you That do? was, I told him after Helen Young. Okay. He was after Helen Young. I'm just going to turn this off because it keeps vibrating. I apologize for that. It's okay. And they fart and I'll have to apologize for that. Okay, there we go. Um. So that was after Helen. Okay. Right. Okay. So Helen was uh, at Crescent Care. Where was uh, where was Helen's room? She was on A side. I had been transferred to A side, which is a new unit, like well, relatively new, then 10, 12 years old. I was on the first floor. I was the charge nurse for the first floor, and she was in the room closest to the nurse's station. Okay. Where, so where was A, was that the, like if I, for me going to um, Crescent Care, would it be closer to Fife or closer to North Shaft? Okay, so or? there's the retirement home. Mm -hmm. There's the wall that joins the retirement home to the, uh, to the nursing home. There's North Point. There's South Point. There's East Point. And then down at the end of the hallway of East Point is uh, unit one and unit two in the building right on top of each other. And what was the purpose of that area of, of present care? Oh, it was it was all single rooms. Okay. 
Yeah. So houses in and around them? Houses in and around them, yeah. It was all in and around that area. Alright. Um, and Helen was a type 2 diabetic with dementia? Yeah. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about Helen. Uh, Helen was miserable. She frequently yelled out, help me nurse. She frequently yelled out she wanted to die. She just was not happy with her life. She would wheel, wheel around in her wheelchair saying, help me nurse, help me nurse, help me nurse, help me nurse. And when you went to help her, what do you want to help with? Nothing. Get away with me. Go away. Help me nurse, help me nurse. Didn't want to eat, didn't want to drink. It's very difficult to deal with. Um, constantly would yell out. And, or we'd say, what do you want to help with? I want to die. Why can't you help me die? I want to die. And one night, it was like something snapped inside. And that red surge came back, and I thought, okay, you will die. So uh, I gave her a shot. I came up to her and said, this is for your pain. And I gave her a shot of long acting or short acting. And she started to settle down. And then um, later on, we put in, her into bed, and I gave her more off, more of the... Uh, Insulin, I think it was long acting. She had a seizure. She turned red. She um, was diaphoretic. The PSWs called me to the bedside. Um, I took all of her vital signs and I pretended to take her blood sugar. And said, right. and said, oh, it's normal. Don't worry about it. How did you go about that with people beside you? Their PSWs. <laughs> Don't, no, don't let anybody no see that part the of PSWs? the... No, but what I mean is, what I mean by that is PSWs, nurses sub, nurses focus on the meds right. and treatment. Okay. PSWs focus on, like, they were busy. They were busy washing her. They were busy changing her. They were busy dealing with the fact that she was having diarrhea. They were not doing the part of the job I was doing. Right. So they never would have noticed. Where's my burger? So they never would have noticed um, me not taking the blood sugar. Because I took her, like I did her pulse, I did everything else. So they wouldn't have noticed that I didn't do that because they were busy with everything else. Okay. Okay. And you just... And I just said, oh, blood sugar's good, 5.6, she's good. Which is a, a number that in your mind you knew was average and nothing concerning the 5.6 yeah. or whatever you said. Yeah. Um, do you remember what shift you were working at this point? Afternoons. I was straight through to 11, but at that point I was straight through to 11 on, on that ward. Okay. That it started a little bit before that. Yeah. Okay. And that would have been an individual room, as you said? Yes. Okay. And do you remember when um, Mrs. Young died? I uh, went two days afterwards. Okay. And if you, do you know if you were pregnant for that? No, it wasn't. Was there a different procedure at all when people passed away in that in that wing opposed to where you were prior to? No, it was all the same nursing home. It was all the same policies. Okay. It was just that that nursing home was that wing of the nursing home was built to accommodate the fact that um, the owner took over Narvilla okay. in Norwich. Okay. So everybody from Narvilla got moved to the new part of the nursing home. So that's the other reason. And then eventually they all got mixed together. Right. Okay. So being that it had been a few years then, um, when you injected uh, Mrs. Young and you were successful in, in causing her death, how did it make you feel after those few years that these urges and these feelings had come back? I felt horrible. I felt angry at myself. I felt like I had failed myself. I felt like God had failed me. Did you continue to practice in the church? I continued going to church, yes. Yeah. Did you believe in it as much as Um, that? I did, but I was getting very confused. So it was soon after that that I went to the pastor and told him what had happened. And uh, he prayed over me. And because he said that was the last thing he would have thought of of me. And his wife was there too, and they prayed over me. And they said to me, Now, this is God's grace. But if, if you ever do this again, we will have to turn you into the police. And where would, these, where would that conversation have taken place? The in, no, in their house at their kitchen table. And I kept going to their church. 
And just how detailed would you have the conversation? Oh, I had told I told him that I was taking people's lives by giving them their phone number. What were you specific with names? How much information no. when you were doing this? No. How many people? I don't know if I told him how many people did, but I was doing it. I wanted to stop. And his response was to pray for you and pray over you. Yeah, put, put his hands on me and have him put his hands on me and pray. What uh, what religion did that church practice? Uh, Did Helen have any family that you recall that would come Yes, she had a niece that loved her very much and was there at least twice a week. Did you ever converse with her? Before before she died, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How old was she? I would say in the late 50s, early 60s. The niece? The niece, yes. Yeah. And Helen or something? 90. Alright. Did you speak to her following Helen's death, her niece? What? I think it was a day or two after when she was gathering her stuff and she cried on my shoulder and thanked me for being a good nurse. And again, the feelings of you at that point? Oh, guilt, shame, anger, like I had betrayed her. And not that I was betrayed, but betrayal, mm -hmm. but I betrayed her. And did you display any emotion at that point to her? Um, I just, you know, gave her a hug back and said I was so sorry. But on that point, in time, I was getting very confused about was this God and was it not. And when you resumed doing this, did you have any, besides the religious feelings that you were having, did you have any other uh, personal um, feelings in your mind as, as far as knowing the difference between right and wrong again? Yes, yes, I knew the difference between right and wrong. But I thought this was something that God or whoever wanted me to do it. I was starting at that point to, to doubt that it was God. Again, this statement is important. If she genuinely believes that she is working for God and carrying out their will that other people in the past have claimed due to their own mental illnesses, she wouldn't have felt guilt or questioned if what she was doing was wrong. In other cases where a person believed that they were working as a proxy of a higher power, they often talk about feeling confident in their actions because they know they were justified. But Elizabeth knew what she was doing was wrong. She took steps to hide her actions and only went after clients who annoyed her. When you resume doing it? Yeah. Okay. Right. Was anyone working with you on that day that you can recall? Um, the PSWs, but I don't remember their names. How many would have there been? Three. Okay. There would have been students, too, I think. But I can't remember. And there would have been 32 patients in that wing as well? Yes. That you're responsible for? Okay. Um, March of 2014. This is Marine Victory Ant Crossing Care. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about Marine. Mm. Marine was a handful. Um, she would attack other patients. She would pull their hair. She would hit them. She would pinch them. Eventually, um, it was decided that she needed a one-on-one -on -one staff. So sometimes they would book an extra PSW to be with her. Sometimes someone would come from the outside to be with her. But when one woman was, wasn't available, it was the role of the church nurse. And that was nuts. Sorry. That's just absolutely nuts. So, um, she just got harder and harder to look after. And one night when I had had to look after her, I got this idea. I thought, you know, I'd started getting the feeling of that surge again. I thought, no, I don't want her to die. But if I could somehow give her enough of a dose to give her a coma, or something to change your brain with, maybe make her less, you know, maybe make her less mobile, hard to handle, less handle, hard to handle. Right. So, uh, yeah, if I overdosed her. 
forcing someone to go into hypoglycemic shock does not change their brain waves to make them a more compliant person. As previously stated, her clients were usually incredibly confused, scared, and senile. They required patience and gentle care, which Elizabeth had agreed she would give them. But instead, when a patient annoyed her, she felt as if they deserved to be punished. And was that in the same yes, she was right across. She had gone into the room that um, Helen had been in. Yeah, she was right across from the nurse's station. As well, I would stay a single room at that point. Yeah, that um, night she stroked. She had a severe stroke, she went to the hospital, and when she came back, she was there, for a few, there at the nursing home for a few days, and she died. But before she came back from the hospital, I was fired from Crescent Care for medication errors that had nothing to do with this. When you went, when you got transferred into this A wing, did you still get the medication the same way? The insulin the same way? Yeah, because there's insulin purchase there. Sorry, Maureen, uh, Mrs. Pickering was transferred from Crest Care to the hospital. And then and back, back to Crest yeah. How, what was the time frame there? Do you remember? Two days, I think. Okay. But they knew that she was totally vegetative when she came back. Okay. So she was basically she was coming back to, to pass away yeah. at Crest Care. Yeah. Was she put in palliative care when she returned? No, because she had her own room. Okay. The palliative care room was for people who didn't have their own room. Right. So that families could go and be with them, okay. and not, you know, not disturb the other residents, and not be disturbed by the other residents. Right. Do you remember how much insulin that you gave to Mrs. Pickering? It was a lot. It was a lot. Um, I'm going to say 80 long acting and 50 short acting, something like that. It was a lot of insulin. Why so much to her? I wasn't sure if she would die or not, and I really wanted to make sure that she, uh, their mind would change a bit before she came after. So the insulin caused her uh, a stroke. A stroke, and then, and then the, the reason to travel to the hospital. Yes. Um, do you remember any reaction from her when you were injecting her? No, none at all. Do you remember what type of the, sorry, apologize, what part of the body that you injected her? her. Left, right. Um, left. Left stuff. Yeah. And no reaction. She didn't um, oh, yeah, the first time I gave it to her, she said, hey, what was that for? And I said, that's your, that's your vitamin injection. Which is a said that you would typically tell people? Yeah. Okay. How long in between when you gave her the next dose? Probably an hour and a half, two hours. And that was about, what time did you say, sir? Oh, I don't know. You were still working in the afternoon, right? Yeah, eight or nine at night. Okay. Okay, yeah, so it's here at, at eight o'clock. You gave her eight units for a nap in that time. Yeah. Did uh, Miss Pickering, do you recall any family that she had? She had two friends that came and saw her a lot. Mm -hmm. She had a boyfriend that would come to see her. Okay. How old was she? Eighty-two. How old was her boyfriend? Oh, I have no idea. No? No. But he would call her regular dentist. He would come to the dentist, yeah. yeah. Was there any restrictions on visiting practices at all, certain hours? Um, basically, no. If they wanted to come late at night, they had to let us know. Okay. So we could let them in and out. Okay. If some, if the, and that was more for pious people. Right. But no, there was no real restrictions. I mean, there was the odd patient who had a restriction like they can't leave the building with this person or they can't leave the building with that person or so and so shows up, call the police, that sort of thing. Do you, do you remember if you were present when she passed away? I was not. I'd already been fired. Okay, so sorry, between the time that she. When were you fired? Um. Late March, early April. Was it when she was at the hospital? Or did she come back and then? She had come back and then I was fired. And then she uh, but, lived for a few more days. Yeah. You were fired in the meantime. Yeah. And she passed. For something that had nothing to do with her. And my timeline may be wrong, mm -hmm. 
It may have been February, because I know that, you no, know, by the middle of April, I was working again at um, Meadow Park Nursing Home. Yeah. What was the, the cause of your your firing one, sorry? There was a medication error. I had had a few medication errors, and strangely enough, not on purpose, one of our residents was missing her long-acting insulin that she got at supper, okay. and it was coming from pharmacy, but I wanted to make sure she got her insulin, mm -hmm. so I took insulin from another person who I thought was the same insulin, but it was short-acting. And it gave her a seizure because she wasn't used to it. And she was she was okay. We we helped her and she was all right. But when they figured it out, I was fired because I had had other medication errors as well. No, no, different thing. I drops. Ah, oh, just a lot of different stuff. And what do you think that was the result of? What med med error? Mm -hmm. The workload. Yeah. Was it anything to do with, were you still using it at this point? Um, you know what, I never made a, I never made a work trip. I never made an error when I was using it at work. Never. Just had you focus? Yeah. Did you ever commit any of these deaths in your reason? No. Not at all. So no med errors, no deaths? When I was using it. Or using it was all the feeling in your chest and your stomach? Yeah, the searching and the, yeah, and then the laughter afterwards, which was really, it was like a cackling from the pit of hell, if that makes sense. Did the cackling continue um, when Mrs. Young was injected with insulin? Um, After that two-year break? Yes, yeah. yes, it did. It, it, same, same cackling. Same cackling. Same feeling, same cackling. So then you, did you work anywhere between Crescent Care and Meadow Park? No. Okay, did you go directly from one to the other? Pretty much, within a month. And would and those medication errors be documented in a reference letter or no. were you made aware of anything like that that Meadow Park uh, would be aware of the reason why you were um, let I go from told Crescent the person that hired me at Meadow Park, she told me she had found my resume somewhere because okay. I never applied to Meadow Park. Oh, really? But she had found my resume somewhere, and she called me because they needed a nurse. Oh, okay. So when we did our interview, her name was Heather, I forget her last name. She's not there anymore. Um, when we did our interview, she said to me, why did you leave? And I told her, I said, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I was fired from Medhairs. And she said, well, tell me about them, and I did. And she said, okay, well, I believe in second chances, so you're hired full-time afternoons, and it was a one-year contract. Okay. And how, how long were you unemployed for then? A month. Just a month? Yeah. Okay. And would you commute back and forth and did you still live in Woodstock at the time? I still live in Woodstock and I commuted back and forth. For straight afternoons? Yeah. What was that? What were the hours for the straight afternoons? Uh, either 6.30, no, sorry, either 2.30 to 10.30 or 3 to 11. Okay. I'm not sure which it was. So when you got to Meadow Park, what was the difference as far as the workflow of the patients that you're responsible for? Were no difference. <laughs> it was extremely similar. The only difference was that the um, RPNs would do the, um, if there were dressings that had to be done at night, mm -hmm. they'd do the dressings on the people at night that were my people. Okay. But other, other than that, yeah. And, um, your supervisor at that point at Meadow Park, was that the same person that hired you, Heather? Or? Yeah. Okay. She was the nursing supervisor. Okay, so she'd be her direct supervisor. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, RPAD or r Yes. Tell me a little bit about her. Um, he was mean. He would grab the nurses and the and CSWs, whenever they were trying to do things for me, he would grab them, he would twist their arms, he would punch them. Very difficult to do uh, care for. And uh, one night I just got that surgery and I thought that you need to go. Had he done something that night? No, not really, just been his normal self. 
and he felt he felt the first needle, and then um, the second needle I got in, and I forgot something about Maureen. I had given her um, a dose of whatever we dosed her with to calm her down before I ever gave her the insulin. I forgot about that. Right, then, uh, so is that in there? there? About Marine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've given her a sedative just before I ever gave her the info. Oh, you said you gave her Haldol? Yeah. yeah. You knew you were called doing that? Yes, I did. And then the two insulin injections? Yeah. Did it come? Did the hell it all calm her? Do you remember? No, no, it didn't. So Art, I gave a large amount of short acting, and a large amount of long acting in between each other. And then I, when I left for the night, he was still okay. When I came back the next day and worked, they said that he had had a stroke, severe stroke, and gone to the hospital. And the nurse that I talked to who'd been on the night before, she said, do you know how low his blood sugar was? And I said, how low? And she said, oh, like one point something. And then, and then she said, but you know what? I went home and I did some research. research mm -hmm. And sometimes having a bad stroke can make your blood sugar go low. Really? Yeah, that's what she said to me. That was so, odd, too? Yeah, that was odd. But, yeah, so he lived for a couple of days and then he passed. Do you remember what nurse that was? The um, first one? It was the night nurse. Um, was a short school team lady. That's what I remember. Okay. Okay. Um, and do you remember what time of the night that you had injected her? Um, I'm gonna say seven thirty and then nine thirty. Okay. And um, his reaction to it? He fought it. Did he? Yeah, but he fought everything. Would you ever, when you were doing this, were you ever, did you ever speak to these people when you were injecting them? No. Would you ever say anything to them? Not unless they asked me what I was doing, then I'd just say it was a right in the injection. But having that, and, and I was documented here a few times, having that feeling of anger and, and frustration, would you ever... No. You would never state anything to vocalize your, your anger towards that person as you were injecting them? No, never. And are then, um, where did you inject him? His arm and his thigh. Okay. And what were you telling him at that point that you were giving him? Did he ask? Um, it's just coming up, but then you need to have your medicine. And eventually I put it in there. Okay. And was there an immediate reaction to him at all? Did he, did he stroke right away? No, he didn't stroke till I left. And then that's when you came in the next day and had the conversation with that Filipino nurse? Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry, I don't remember her name. It's okay. Um, the four or five days later when he passed away, do you remember if that was back at Meadow Park or was it in the hospital? Yeah, it was in the hospital. Oh, so he never been, came back. It may have just been two or three days. It seemed like it was four or five. Mm -hmm. And his family was devastated. Absolutely devastated. What was his uh, health like at that point? Prior to other than him. other than dementia, he was fairly strong. He was in a wheelchair, but he was a good eater and he was strong. And How old was he? I'm gonna say maybe 78. Okay. And who was his family members? He had a son named Art, who uh, did um, stand up comedy. Oh no! Okay. Yeah, like I I think it was just like open mic night. Right. And then his his wife. That's it. That's all I remember. I know he had other, but that's the only ones I remember. Do you remember if there were other son or daughters, or just other family members that you could? Remember? There were other family members involved, but I don't recall. Okay. Okay. Um. Did you ever have any interaction with his family? I mean, you said they were devastated. When did you learn of that? How did you? Well, they that? came in to take stuff out of his room. Following his death? Well, he was still in the hospital. They okay. came in to take some stuff, and then when he was gone, they came in to take the rest. Okay. How did you feel having a conversation with him? 
awful. Um, again, my head betrays me. How are you feeling right now? Can I go to the
Nurse Wings, he was he had dementia, he was diabetic. Um, he could be uncooperative. And uh, I gave him a large overdose um, because I thought it was his turn to go. That was Wayne? That was Wayne. And mm-hmm. sorry, how old was, sorry, and I hate to go back, but I just have a few more questions. How old was Cotilda? Cotilda was 90 or so. Okay, and her sister? Alvina was probably 80, 82. And did they have family that would come and visit? Yes, yes. Very much so. Who would that be that would come to visit? Cotilda, I think it was her daughters, and Alvina was her husband. Okay. And long acting, short acting? Short acting at that point. You know, so that you're still doing short acting. Okay. And you remember the dose that oh, they would have given? Oh, wait a second. What would they get at night? It was long acting, so it was what they got at night. With those two, it was their own insulin, just extra dose. So okay. probably age 20 to 30 to 40. 30 to 40. Right. Extra. Okay. And then Wayne, how old was Wayne, sorry? I'd say 60. Okay. Oh, so he was younger. He, yeah, he had developmental, developmental challenges, as well as dementia, as well as being diabetic, um, as well as being handful. Um, and, uh, he wanted to die, so, again, that one night I just felt that surging, and, but uh-huh. he didn't die. I think How did you know he wanted to die? He would say it sometimes, that he just wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Where was Wayne in the present He was in room 8, which is the men's ward down at the end. So, 8, or 8, eight, eight, eight a number? 8 north, 8 north. And would that be a roommate in there as well? Yes. Do you know who he was roomed with? Uh? No. No. Alright, and Mike with Huntington's disease? That was 2009. What, what is that disease? It robs you of your body and you still have your mind. You get progressively more agitated, you get progressively more um, psychotic and you're in a wheelchair and you've got all these movements that you can't control. It's a horrible disease. And how old was Mike? He was 54. And uh, again, one night I just felt that surging and I thought, now this must be God because this man is not enjoying his life at all. So I gave him a large amount of insulin. I think I gave him 90 total. Did he ever do anything to harm you? No, never. Did Wayne? No. Albina? No. Cotilda? No. Um, this takes us to a different location, Telford Place in Paris. That's obviously Paris, Ontario, correct? Yeah. That's side of, uh, of Brantford, Woodstock area. 2016 winter. Okay, and that was Sandra? Yeah, How I old was, was Sandra? Sandra, I think she was in her 70s. Okay. And... Telford Place, what, what was the breakup of the rooms there? Where was she located? Was um, she, was, she was down the wing, straight down from the um, nurse's desk, about two doors on the left. Okay. And she had three roommates. Okay. And she described her a little bit of personality in her health? Um, tall, um, not very well. She didn't walk anymore. She had a good sense of humor. Um, she often said she didn't want to be there. Mm-hmm. And so one night I gave her a instant overdose. But she survived because the nurse that came on next um, went to check on her to do something else and noticed that she was sweaty mm-hmm. and took her blood sugar and saved her life. Mm-hmm. Okay. And how did these other people survive? Um, it just didn't, oh, Clotilda and Albina, they found them to have short blood, sh- they found them to have low blood sugar, and they gave them such a rate that Wayne and Mike, they just survived. It was never found out. Was there anything to do with the gender, male or female, that this influenced the effect of it, or was it just, again, not just dependent on the makeup yeah. of their body and their health? And yeah, not that I know this has anything to do with gender. Um, the nurse who saved Sandra. Yeah. Was there anything that ever came back on you? No. Any retribution consequences? No. She never figured it out that I know of. 
She even asked me about it and asked me if I thought she'd done the right thing. Who was that? Do you remember her name? Diane, I don't remember her last name. And what, what were you working at that point? What's just where you were working at Delta Police? Whatever I got called in for. I was actually working for a nursing agency at that time called Lifeguard Agency, mm -hmm. and I was sent to tell friends of Lifeguard. I see. So you were never employed by Telford Place? No. No, I was employed by Lifeguard, and I would go to Telford and to other places as well. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's when you got involved with the Unlimited as well, right? You were with Lifeguard? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, I was only with St. Elizabeth this like a month and a half before I quit. 2016 of August, which is not too long ago, um, you're employed with St. Elizabeth, it says here. Yeah, I was frustrated with my job. I was, had a huge, um, huge workload, having to learn a lot of new things, just a lot of frustration. Um, the weekend that this happened, there I had all, all of the people that I had to look after. Most of them were in Ingersoll. I didn't know any of them. And uh, on the Saturday, I went in and I was doing my care. And uh, this is really the only one that was pre-planned, because on Saturday, when I was doing care on Beverly, I noticed that she had a PICC line, which is the line that takes medication straight to your heart, mm -hmm. and that she was a diabetic. And so the next day when I went in, I was really frustrated, and I could just really feel the surging and the laughing, and I... I gave her a huge amount. I gave her, I think it was 180, three, three doses of 60 okay. through the pick line. Did she question that at all? No, because I used one to rinse the pick line, one to put into her eye, and if I had some one to rinse the pick line again. Okay. And uh, she survived. She was fine the next day. Did you go see her next day? No, but I was able to check it on my computer because she was seen every day by a nurse. Okay. So I could go into the tablet from work and see how she was. Okay. And that was just a computer program used by St. Elizabeth? Yes. I see. Okay. On their own tablet. Okay. And these other people, where did you inject them? Uh, their arms. All of them? All of them, yeah. Sandy was probably her leg, but she was a little bit more difficult. In August of, of 2016, then, with Beverly, you don't remember Beverly's last name? No, I don't. I don't even remember if her first name was Beverly. Oh, okay. I could probably, oh, I don't know if I could tell you the weekend it was or not. But she lived in Ingersoll? Yes. Did she live in a home or? Uh, yeah, in a home. Like, like a her home. own residence, I mean, or? Do you remember where you saw it was? No, I don't. No. Um, how can you have a name Beverly, but you're not sure what her name is? Because I'm not sure if it was Bev or B or... I got you. Okay. Okay. And that was the only one you had given through a thick line? Yes. Did you know what the result would be compared to a direct injection into an arm or a leg or a thigh? I'd never done it line? before. I never looked at it. I had no idea. She went, she went to sleep fairly quickly, and I left, but when I checked uh, the next day to see how she was for the next nurse, there was no change. How old was she? She was 63, 64. And what was her diagnosis as far as her health? She was diabetic, and she had large ulcers on her leg. And she also had a um, severe infection. How does that make you feel going through all that? Awful. Do you feel like there's a burden on your shoulders? Yes, I've really? done the right thing. Do you feel there's a sense of relief? Yes, and now I know that it wasn't God, and I'm ashamed of myself that that happened, but I also think that it was mental health. You know, I think it was, I was in my, in my right mind. Or I would have been able to tell them. And who, I was raised to believe in God. I was raised from a baby to go to Sunday school. So how could I get such a strong feeling that this is what God wanted? 
unless it was something wrong with my head. I know we've talked about what you would say to the families and, and so on and so forth, but um, again, I, I, I feel terrible for the for the people that are going to find out in the days and, and weeks to come about what actually happened to their loved ones, right? I do. Um, I feel horrible. Um, if there was ever anything I could do so that nobody did this again, I'd do it. Just a few other things to cover off then. Okay. Um, the things that some of these people would do to you, the hitting, the pinching, the grabbing of your breasts, would you ever report that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was always reported in the charge as well. And that's just documented on their charts? Yeah. Okay. And was there any, there's obviously never, not obviously, but was there ever any charges or criminal matters that came up any of this no, at all? Oh, no. That's part of working in the nursing home. That's just what they do. Might even be your fault, dear. Mrs. Conway. When people say that nursing is a thankless job, this is what they mean. Although being groped and hit at work should never be commonplace, when you're working with a person who is in the later stages of dementia, they're not in their right mind. They aren't trying to cause harm for any other reason than they are scared and uncomfortable. They don't know what's happening, and they don't know why this person is sticking them with needles and sharp objects. Um, Maureen, your ex. What was Maureen's last name? I think about what, four years ago when she wanted money to move back. Oh. We were only together for a year. Okay. So she came here from. Yeah, and brought her two kids. Okay. The teenage kids. Yeah. I think you mentioned them here at home. Yeah, we got involved in that. We'll see, I guess, with them. Mm -hmm. When they were here? Mm hmm. Have you, this document that you prepared, Beth, and I know that you had stated the reason why, I guess we call it the breaking point of why you stopped, yeah. was the possibility that you were going to have to be dealing with kids. Yes, that's right. Right? Yeah. Is there anyone else within your career path that isn't listed on these four documents, or these four pieces of paper? that you'd be responsible for the deaths? No, absolutely not. And if we were to tell you that we'd come across some fairly significant or suspicious uh, deaths at other nursing homes? Where it's in? Right. What would you say to that? I'd say it wasn't me. So there's no one else involved? No. Um, that was fell victim to your actions? No. Um, just just repeat to me again the people that you've disclosed this to besides myself tonight. Okay. Um, the very first person I ever disclosed it to was um, another girlfriend at the time. Her name was... That was after I killed a couple of people and uh, she told me not to do it again or she was going to turn me into the police. Um, that, oh, I couldn't tell you, 2008, I think. Um, and then, uh, 2011, when I decided to stop killing, my friend, I told her what I'd been doing and that I had stopped. And then, um, I told my pastor. And then after that, I told the, in 2014, um, after Art passed away, I uh, went on a holiday, and uh, that's when I really decided that this had to stop. And so um, I told um, a friend who lives in BC. Um, then uh, I told when I came back, I got a good from a lawyer. And then while I was in the Toronto, it was in CAMH. Well, I told my friend, before everyone, I've told my cousin, I told my friend, 
and I told my friend. And then while I was in TMH, I told um, someone who I thought was a friend. They turned around and called the police to make sure that it had really been dealt with. And I understand that he thought he was doing the right thing. I understand that, but he had said, oh, I won't tell anybody. And I was using him as a resource for support, and he turned around. Right. When I was, when I'd already, you know, I'd already shared it, so why would he call the police? So why do you because you fucking said you killed someone, Elizabeth. Good Lord. Do you think that none of these people confronted police? Maybe they didn't believe me. I don't know. Maybe they just thought, maybe they thought I was doing more something than the patient one have done. You know? And as far as believing you were these close people to you, that you've shared other deep, dark secrets with maybe over time? That I, I would say deep, dark secrets with lots of stuff, yeah. Because this is a pretty serious thing. Yes, it is. It's right. horrible. I'm telling you. It's the worst thing. Telling these people, I you know, just find it hard to believe that no one would come forward until just five, six people down the road, right? Yeah. Of, of having knowledge of it. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. And everything that you're telling us is the truth. Yes, it is. There's yes, sir. nothing that's been fabricated. No, sir. No. And you're sure about that? I know. After her confession, Elizabeth was charged with eight counts of murder. After further investigation, she was also charged with four counts of attempted murder and two counts of aggravated assault. On June 26th, that same year, she was sentenced to eight concurrent life terms in prison, with no possibility of parole for 25 years. If you have made it to this portion of the video, thank you for watching. If you like this video and want to see more content like it, feel free to like and subscribe to our channel. If you want to support us and get early access to videos, consider supporting us on Patreon, which is linked in the description box down below. With all of that said, have a great day, and remember to stay safe.